The next item of business is a debate on motion 6889 in the name of Mary Goujon on Scotland's approach to 2022 coastal states negotiations securing principled sustainable outcomes. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Mary Goujon to speak to and move the motion up to 15 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate is a welcome opportunity to set out Scotland's approach to this year's fisheries negotiations. This is my second year leading Scotland through the annual negotiations, and it's a task I don't take lightly, and one in which my key priority is always to protect Scotland's interests. I want to continue to build on the achievements gained in 2022, which saw negotiated outcomes across a range of forums, providing Scotland with over £400 million of fishing opportunities. Fishing is a vital sector uh, to Scotland and to our coastal communities. It's an industry that supplies us with a healthy and nutritious source of protein. And the positions that we take need to reflect what we're currently living through and a time when people across Scotland are being affected by the most severe economic crisis in a generation. Decisions we make should recognise the cultural importance of fishing through maintaining and, where possible, strengthening coastal communities and livelihoods alongside the requirement for fish stocks to reach and maintain sustainable levels. It's vital that we set appropriate fishing opportunities using the best scientific advice available, which balance environmental, economic and social considerations. The ongoing cost of living crisis is just one of the many challenges that has impacted on the Scottish fishing industry and the wider seafood sector in recent years. We can't forget the ongoing impacts of leaving the EU and, of course, recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. In these uncertain times, it's important that we deliver appropriate and timely negotiated outcomes to give the fleets and processing industries assurance of their fishing opportunities for the start of 2023. Presiding officer, before I move on to speak about the annual negotiations in more detail, I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. I know that I'll be joined by all members in the chamber today in condemning the actions of Russia. Scotland stands with Ukraine and for democracy, human rights and the rule of law at home and abroad. And we enter negotiations this year against a backdrop of great uncertainty and global change. The majority of our fish stocks are not managed in isolation, but in partnership with our coastal state neighbours. Scotland has taken a strong stance on engagement with Russia in fisheries negotiations during 2022. We've advocated for their exclusion from discussions where mechanisms allow for this to happen. And in consultations where the Russian Federation are also present, we are actively working to ensure that they see no benefit from these negotiations. We've supported the UK in making clear statements and in not co-signing fisheries agreements where the Russian Federation are also signatories. This is an important principle, which Scotland will carry forward throughout this, negoti this negotiating season and until Russia's atrocious actions have ceased. Now, moving back to our approach this year, it's important that we continue to be a reasonable and positive partner both within the UK and with like-minded coastal states, aiming to achieve agreements of mutual benefit to all. With the exception of two stocks, every quota is shared with partners and negotiated on uh, to reach agreed positions. It's not a simple Scotland-only choice, and that's the nature of fish stocks in our wide-ranging marine environment. The Scottish Government's overarching approach to the annual negotiations will not come as a surprise and remains consistent and in line with our already well-established principles. My hope and expectation is that these will continue to be supported by members across the Chamber here today. As ever, our management approach will be informed by the best available scientific advice, socio-economic considerations and choke risk, as well as being underpinned by national and international commitments. I can assure the Chamber that this commitment to responsible fisheries management, while remaining alive to the socio-economic impact on coastal communities, will apply where there is reduced advice as well as increased advice. In some cases, there will need to be a cut in catches to allow the stocks to recover and for a meaningful package of spatial, temporal and technical management measures to complement any cut and ensure a rapid recovery. During last year's debate, I highlighted... 
I, just in one moment. During last year's debate, I highlighted the principle of using total allowable catch constraints as a management tool, and our intention is to use them again this year as one of our broad principles and where that's appropriate. And I'd be happy to take Mr Carson's intervention. Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. I, I take on board uh, the importance of ensuring fisheries, environment, coastal communities, social and economic. But would you not agree that the, the, the Butte House Agreement damaged uh, the reputation between Scottish fisheries and the Scottish Government, uh, which was played out in the, 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 the Clyde uh, Cod Box uh, debacle. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. As the member has highlighted and as I have outlined, this is a very complex area in relation to fisheries. We have got a number of considerations that we need to take into different account. I have said previously when I appeared in front of the committee, I have also said uh, in this chamber that in relation to that, of course, we identified it could have been handled better and we've worked to try and improve relationships since that time. So again, I recognise that as I have done previously. Now coming back to that, I, oh, I, yes, I'd be happy to. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm most grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way and commend her for the work she's doing in, in leading these, uh, these negotiations as I did for several years. Could, could I ask whether she agrees with me that one of the aspects that's causing major damage to fishers in Scotland is the tough uncompromising, hard uh, attitude taken by the UK towards immigration, towards crew that often come from other parts of the world and are essential to the inshore fleet, for example, in Clyde, but also throughout the coast. And that immigration problem is what's causing the damage to our industry. Cabinet Secretary. I would agree with the member that this is indeed a, a critical issue. I see this right across the, the fishing industry, the processing sector as well, and it is due to the hard Brexit that was imposed on us. Now, coming back to the, the use of total allowable catch, now, the reason that we adopt that, um, in most situations there are a large year-to-year -year fluctuation in TAC, undermines the sustainability and stability of the fishing industry with a constraint which looks to mitigate those fluctuations. However, where stocks have taken consistent cuts across a number of years and where the advice allows for this, larger changes in TAC might be desirable. Now, moving to the, nego the negotiations themselves, this year has already been a busy time. Talks have been held throughout the year on management measures for some key stocks, and this is now coupled with the annual negotiation cycle, which commenced last month. As I speak, my negotiators are in Brussels for bilateral and trilateral consultations with the EU and Norway, who are two of our closest fishing neighbours. Consultations have already been held for coastal state pelagic stocks and the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission with the UK Faro bilateral scheduled for December. I know stakeholders from both the fishing and environmental sectors have been engaging with my teams throughout and I really want to thank them for that ongoing input because as always their advice is critical in helping us make decisions as we seek balanced agreements to protect Scottish interests. I am encouraged by the positive scientific advice this year for some of our key demersal stocks, and this is evidence that our management actions are having the desired impacts. And it's my hope and expectation that this will help facilitate agreements with other coastal states across the fora in which we negotiate these stocks. And to try and bring that to life, I'd just like to highlight some of Scotland's priorities covering the suite of negotiations that we're involved in. On our trilateral negotiations with the EU and Norway, I'm pleased by the positive advice this year for North Sea Cod and SAFE, two important stocks for the Scottish fleet. The advice for North Sea Cod in particular follows a challenging few years. In 2020, the Fisheries Management and Conservation Group agreed to a range of management measures packaged together as the National Cod Avoidance Plan. This plan was developed by Marine Scotland in partnership with industry, and I want to pay tribute to those fishers and environmental groups that worked with Marine Scotland on the recovery of this iconic stock. This is testament to what can be achieved through strong co-management. Now, while the picture for cod and safe is looking positive, I am concerned about the immediate outlook for northern shelf monkfish, a stock we manage bilaterally with the EU. The advice for this stock is for a 30% decrease on the 2022 TAC based on a data limited assessment. Mitigating this cut is a top priority for Scotland in the EU bilateral negotiations and we're looking at a number of negotiating strategies here. 
A decrease of this size when abundance, at least in some areas, suggests the stock may not be in need of such action will have significant impacts on some of our key ports, particularly in the Highlands and Islands. For some vessels, it equates to a 20% loss in revenue, and given the cost crisis, this is, of course, a significant concern. A further priority will also be to work in partnership to resolve the assessment challenges everyone faces with this stock. A wide range of other stocks will be discussed during the EU bilateral, and, as always, the scientific advice shows a mixed picture. I am really pleased to hear that the North East Atlantic spur dog stock is beginning to recover from its status as a prohibited species. When I meet with fishers, particularly in the Clyde, I hear their concerns about the high levels of unavoidable bycatch of this stock. We now have scientific advice which mirrors what's happening on the fishing grounds. This stock has been a prohibited species for five years and its transition to a directed fishery will need to follow a robust process. It's vital that we take responsible and precautionary steps to ensure that the recovery of this stock isn't short-lived. I'm pleased that we were able to reach bilateral agreements with both Norway and the Faroe Islands for 2022, both of which provide important opportunities for Scottish vessels. In particular, the exchange of opportunities with Faroe provides an important release valve for our vessels away from the North Sea. I am aware that there were some technical challenges towards the start of the year which impacted on the fishery in Faroese waters. However, this isn't unexpected for the first year of a new arrangement, and I am pleased that the Scottish industry now have, uh, now have been able to utilise these quotas. I see significant benefit in maintaining and building upon the long-established relationships with our neighbouring fishing nations. For 2023, I've instructed officials to seek to agree bilateral arrangements that are balanced, fair and bringing in stocks of most need for our industry, not only between the parties, but also within the UK. Last but not least are the coastal state consultations on shared, highly migratory pelagic stocks, mackerel, blue whiting and Atlantoscandian herring, or ash. These are of key importance to Scotland and we are the majority quota holder in the UK. Unfortunately, there are currently no agreed sharing arrangements for these stocks, which means that unilateral quotas bring the total catch limit above agreed limits. This is not a situation I can condone, and it's imperative that everything is done to ensure appropriate management to protect the long-term sustainability of the fisheries. However, I am happy to report that 2022 has seen positive strides forward for North East Atlantic mackerel. Over the course of the year, officials from all coastal states have been engaging and have met a number of times, working towards agreeing a comprehensive sharing arrangement. As Scotland's single most valuable stock, this is a top priority for us, and I'm pleased by the progress that has been made, but there is still further work to be done. I've instructed officials to continue to put their full energy behind these talks, and every effort will be made to reach agreement as soon as possible. Scotland, uh, not at the moment. Scotland will continue to strive for agreement on shares which are fair, based on robust evidence, reflecting the distribution of the stocks and with as many parties signed up as possible. And this will in turn provide the long-term stability and management that we will all wish to see for these stocks. In addition, parties have also agreed to continue discussions on agreeing sharing arrangements for blue, whiting and ash early in 2023. While discussions are ongoing, it's more important than ever that appropriate catch limits are set for 2023 for all three stocks. Scotland is fully committed to promoting sustainable fishing and will continue to act responsibly in this regard. Aligning with the future fisheries management strategy and as underlined by the quotas we've set in the absence of sharing arrangements, which continue to respect historic levels. Presiding officer, as we move through the annual negotiation cycle, these commitments and objectives will be at the forefront of our decision making. We will continue to seek the best outcome for Scotland's environment, fishing interests and our coastal communities. We will take robust, principled decisions based on the best available scientific information. And we will work closely. I am drawing to a close, so no, I won't take an intervention. And we will work closely and collaboratively with stakeholders and coastal state partners to ensure the sustainable utilisation of these important stocks in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Colin Smith to speak to and move Amendment 6889.1 up to 11 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. In the last few days in my South Scotland region, a fisherman tragically died in hospital after being rescued from his capsized trawler in Loose Bay, just off Port William. I know all our thoughts 
will be with his family and his friends. That tragedy is a reminder to us all of the dangers faced by our fishing fleet and the courage of those who work in the industry. Every day, Scotland's fishers go to sea to put that healthy, quality, low-carbon food on our tables, and they do so in the most challenging conditions, in the most dangerous of occupations. And for that, we owe each and every one of them a great debt of gratitude. And at a time families are facing a cost of living crisis and the world is facing a climate and nature catastrophe, putting high quality, affordable food on our tables and in a sustainable way has never been more important. So those fishers deserve not just our gratitude, but also our support. So I wish the Scottish Government well in securing the best possible agreement for the fishing sector and an environment in the array of annual negotiations taking place and when it comes to the distribution of quotas secured at those negotiations. The Scottish Government may have chosen not to deliver a, a Scottish Fisheries Act and instead rely on the framework set out in the UK Fisheries Act, even in relation to devolved areas. But crucial decisions on quota distribution and fisheries management in Scotland still rest with the Scottish Government, as they did before Brexit, and it is Scottish ministers who decide how our seas are used. When this debate was held last year at the time of the, the 2021 coastal state negotiations, I set out five tests Labour would judge the Government on in relation to the establishment and distribution of sustainable fishing quotas and the management of our seas. The first test is whether those fishing quotas negotiated and subsequently distributed are within maximum sustainable yield. Now, delivering against fixed MSY targets in mixed fisheries where individual stocks are subject to fluctuating scientific advice is difficult. I accept that. And I know ICES advice is often challenged, despite it being based on the best data in fishery science available. But as the Cabinet Secretary said, this year, some of that advice is positive, including an 82 per cent increase in the catch advice from North Sea Cod, which will be welcomed, albeit from a low tonnage. But when that advice is not positive, well, it is important to seek to mitigate the impact as best we can when it does come to setting those tax. And that will certainly be the case, as the Cabinet Secretary uh, stated, with regards to, to monkfish. What we can't afford to do is to continually exceed maximum yields. That's not, that's not sustainable. It doesn't meet Sustainable Development Goal 14, and it is against the Scottish Government's own National Marine Plan. There's been some progress in delivering quotas in line with maximum yields, but government scientists at the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science analysed 2022 quota against scientific advice. And, we, and if we look at the 11 stocks used by the Scottish Government in their Scottish Marine Assessment in 2020, only two stocks, Haddock in some areas of the North Sea and West of Scotland, actually pass this test. Hake, mackerel, heron, cod and whiting in various stocks all failed. President Officer, of course we want to... I certainly will, yeah. Finlay Carson. I, I thank Colin Smith for taking the intervention. Would, would Mr Smith agree with me that the people who know where the fish are, uh, the best people to, to, to answer that are the, the fishermen themselves. And we need to build that trust in the relationship between the fishermen and scientists and the government to make sure that total allowable catches are actually based on the best mm -hmm. evidence available. Colin Smith. I think Finlay Carson makes an important point. We need to, to listen to our fishers, but we also need to listen and work together with the scientists who set out that, that, that basis for the advice it's given. Because although we all want the highest quotas possible for our fishers, overfishing means lower, not higher quotas in the future. It depletes our public fish assets and it reduces the amount available in the long term. And that's damaging, ultimately, to the fishers we want to support. The Labour's second test is whether the actions of ministers are delivering a fairer and my more diverse distribution of quota allocation in Scotland. Quota continues to be handed out based on who has fixed quota allocations, historically given to those who had previously caught fish, but subsequent trading has meant ownership is now highly consolidated. For example, four companies control 55 per cent of the North Sea mackerel quota. President officer, we do need a more diverse allocation of quota and we need more focus on who will deliver for our environment, for jobs, for local economies. When my colleague Aras Sawa wrote to the First Minister about Labour's five tests, in her reply, she acknowledged the concentration of quota ownership and stated, and I quote, in recent years we have acted to allocate a greater share of mackerel quota to our inshore vessels to be caught 
by handline. But the 2021 landings data show this represents just 1% of the total mackerel landings by Scottish boats. The majority, 96%, continues to be made by the big pelagic trawlers. So on the second test of whether the Scottish Government are serious about a fairer, more diverse distribution of quota, it's another fail. Labour's third test is the principle that Scottish seafood should be landed in Scotland. Now, I appreciate that price or processing capacity can often be a driver in decisions about where catch is landed, but the fact is far too much of Scotland's seafood is landed abroad, which means that Scotland's economy, food system, jobs, our coastal communities are being bypassed. We have seen a consistent decline in the volume of fish landed by Scottish ships into Scottish ports since the 1980s. In 2021, just 46 per cent of the mackerel caught by Scottish boats was actually landed in Scotland and just 63 per cent of the heron. For other less well-known species like blue whiting, the numbers are even worse. Just 29 per cent caught by Scottish boats using Scottish quota was actually landed in Scotland. The rest went directly to foreign ports, mostly to be processed into fish meal. Scottish ministers claim to be addressing this through a clause in the fishing licence, but that clause is so weak it only requires boats to land 55 per cent of their catch in Scotland, dropping to 30 per cent if the species is mackerel or heron. That is much weaker than the clause being implemented by DEFRA in England, which requires that 70 per cent of catches are landed to UK ports. So, President Officer, on the test of whether Scottish catch is landed in Scottish ports is another fail for the Scottish Government, and that is letting down Scotland's coastal communities. Labour's crucial fourth test is whether quota is being used to incentivise a change towards lower impact and less bycatch forms of fishing. We know that some fishing methods cause serious environmental harm. Scotland's marine assessment in 2020 found that fishing was the most significant and widespread pressure on Scotland's seas. In particular, bottom trawling and other mobile contact and fishing methods have led to widespread changes to the marine ecosystem. The UK Fisheries Act establishes a duty, a duty on Scottish ministers to, and I quote, incentivise the use of selective fishing gear and the use of fishing techniques that have reduced, have reduced impact on the environment when distributing quota and effort limits. But that's simply not happening. There are no conditions regarding low impact or selectivity being applied to quota distribution. In fact, the government's future catching policy appears to be deregulating, discarding and removing any disincentive to throw away dead fish. So, President Officer, on the test of whether quotas are being used to incentivise a change towards forms of fishing of a lower impact and less bycatch, it is another fail. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, even if she is not inclined to support Labour's amendment today and therefore support that sustainability we want to see, at the very least, will she agree to Labour's call for the Government to report on an annual basis on what action they are taking to meet this test, to meet that legal requirement under Section 25 of the 2020 Fisheries Act? Labour's fifth and final test is whether the actions of Government lead to a fairer share of catching opportunities being secured for Scottish fishers. Fishing provides thousands of jobs in Scotland. It is home to 70 per cent of the UK fishing sector. These jobs are often in our most fragile rural communities. It generates almost £300 million a year in Scotland in gross value added, with the fish processing sector contributing another £400 million. But both figures have not increased markedly in the last four or five years and are unlikely to do so, not least because of the poor trade and cooperation agreement with the EU, which will mean little change before 2026 and who knows what beyond. The sector faces many challenges, increasing energy costs, higher interest payments and loans for the purchase of vessel, rising costs of supplies as inflation continues to spiral out of control, difficulties accessing workforce and understandable growing wage demands. And I know from me the meeting myself and Nas Sarwar had with the Scottish Fishermen's Federation in Aberdeen recently, a particular concern exists over a spatial squeeze, not least as a result of the growth of offshore wind. Whilst I do not agree with the way in which the, the Green SNP Government are leasing Scotland's seabeds for offshore wind on the cheap to mainly foreign-owned multinationals with no meaningful conditionality on supply chain jobs, offshore wind is vital if we are to meet our net zero ambitions. But when we are offshoring wind, we should not also be offshoring the profits and offshoring the jobs. And we should be working with fishers to mitigate the concerns they have 
over the fact that while in 2000 fishing boats were excluded from less than 1% of UK waters, the concern is that by 2050 from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation is we could see fishing effort excluded from no less than 49% of the exclusive economic zone around the UK as a whole, up to 56% in Scotland. Given the plan for more marine protected areas and offshore wind farms, the Scottish Government really do need to be clearer on how it will mitigate and indeed compensate for the impact on our fisheries. Marine Scotland's failure to deliver the 2015 National Marine Plan means there is no proper spatial planning for fishing. So I hope when closing today, the Cabinet Secretary will tell us what assessment has been made of the displacement of fishing areas as more marine protected areas and offshore wind is developed and when we will actually see that proper spatial plan for fishing. Presiding officer, in concluding, there is little within the government's motion that I disagree with, so Labour will be supporting it. But I move the amendment in my name in an effort to ensure that we see more action from government to support our fishing industry, and we will continue to assess and hold to account ministers on our five tests on whether negotiations and quota distributions deliver a better deal for smaller boats and low-impact fishing, whether they lead to more catch being landed in Scottish ports and ultimately whether they genuinely deliver a sustainable fishing industry for the benefit of our environment and all our coastal communities. Thank you, Mr Smith. I now call on Rachel Hamilton. Around 11 minutes, please, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd uh, firstly like to begin my remarks by thanking all of those who work in our fishing, fishery sector, whether they be the thousands of fishers employed on Scottish registered vessels, those who work in our processing firms, and those who work to promote our fantastic fish and shellfish. In my constituency of Ettrick, Roxburgh, and Berwickshire, a statue at the seafront in Eyemouth commemorates the lost lives of 189 fishermen from Eyemouth. Burnmouth, Cove and Coldingham, snatched in, a, in bleak conditions on the 14th of October 1881, known as Black Friday, reminding us that our fishermen risk their lives in all weathers so that we can have food on our plates, and we must never forget that. We must make sure that Scotland's fishing industry gets the support it deserves. Every year, a high bar is set for the expectations of the annual fisheries negotiations. Without a doubt, securing the best possible fishing opportunities for our Scottish fleets is key, whilst committing to fishing sustainably in line with our national and international commitments. To help all parties achieve the total achievable catch for the year ahead, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas provides data and science. And whilst this is generally accepted, according to the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, what is provided makes assumptions and contains uncertainties resulting in inaccuracies. To prove a point, presiding officer, in previous years, cod coat quotas were cut dramatically. However, ICs have now recognised that cod are more abundant in the northern part of the North Sea and have recommended an increase of 82% in catch advice. Another key commercial stock for part of the Scottish whitefish fleet is monkfish, but according to the SFF, one of the priorities for the Scottish fleet for 2023 will be mitigating the 30% cut in catch advice recommended by ICs for monkfish. They say that the cut is based on an inadequate assessment categorisation that has resulted in overly precautionary approach that doesn't reflect Scotch flu uh, stock fluctuations. So, while we should pay attention to the data and science from international bodies, it's absolutely vital, presiding officer, that we listen to those who carefully um, know most about the seas. We should put the most stock in what Scotland's fishing sector tells us when discuss sorry, discussing total allowable catch with Shetland fishermen, they agreed that often listening and accepting help from the fishing sector helps with the overall picture, ultimately supporting what scientific model predicts, but also accounting for changes happening right now in our seas. And we heard exactly that point from representatives at a roundtable held by the RAIN Committee just a few weeks ago. Not forgetting the pelagic stocks, there's also talks going on between the coastal states on mackerel sharing, and both UK and Scottish governments are working very hard to secure a good outcome for Scotland. Ultimately, it's important that the UK and those who fish this stock sustainably are not undermined by the actions of other coastal states who perhaps don't fish as sustainably. The Scottish industry has been actively improving sustainability through measures such as um, improving the selectivity of fishing gear, making significant investment and commitment to gathering uh, data and science, and an industry-led fisheries observer scheme that provides enhanced data for stock assessment and provides 
pra practical advice and support for science projects that require direct observation at sea on commercial vessels. In 2020, an estimated 69% of commercial fish, fish stocks were fished at sustainable levels in Scottish water, which represents an increase of three percentage points from 2019 and 35 pe po percentage points from 2000. The percentage fished sustainably in 2020 is the highest level recorded since this data collection began and demonstrates the ongoing recovery of commercial fish stocks. Presiding officer, we will see the joint fishery statement published, I believe, tomorrow, imminently. This will set out how the fisheries administrations across the UK will seek to achieve the objectives of the Fisheries Act based on the three key pillars, environmental, social and economic sustainability. The Scottish industry is committed to fishing sustainably, as I've said, and the evidence in the national performance indicators shows the evidence of this. The Scottish Government must demonstrate that the Scottish fishing industry has a sustainable future through protection of space for um, fishing in Scotland's seas. And moving on to the issue of crowded seas that has been brought up um, by Colin Smith, we know that Scotland's seas are becoming increasingly crowded. Future demand for space in our seas by offshore renewables and marine conservation areas will create challenges. A couple of week, weeks ago, the Cabinet Secretary and I attended the Scottish Fishermen's Federation launch of their report into spatial squeeze. Analysis shows that over the next 30 years, in the worst case scenario, trawling could be restricted from over half of Scotland's share of the UK's exclusive economic zone. And by 2050, fishing activity could be excluded from 45% of the EEZ. There are real issues with our crowded seas that are affecting the entire industry, from fisheries to ports and harbours to fishermen. We need to make sure that both of Scotland's governments appreciate and tackle these issues. The industry faces a major challenge in the medium to longer term, though, increased spatial pressures on fishing. The hugely increased competition for space in the marine environment, as I've said, is a serious concern. We know that there is a real risk that the spatial uh, squeeze increases increasingly displaces Scotland's fishing uh, fleet and politicians from all parties must make sure that the industry is supported at this very challenging time. There is much work to be done to reduce the impact um, as much as possible because food security is as every bit as important as energy security and we all are agreed that our collective ambition to reach net zero must not mean zero fishing. As Sheila Keith from Shetland's Fishermen's Association said, the SNP government needs to be more transparent and follow the science, not only to tackle climate change, but to tackle the challenges in our seas. But I would challenge every party in the chamber today that we can do both. We can tackle climate change and help Scottish fisheries to survive and thrive. The Butte House Agreement by the Greens and the SNP to secure a mandate for an independence referendum agreed a designation of at least 10% of Scotland's seas as highly protected marine areas, where essentially nothing will be permitted. Whilst I understand the goal of that is to help our environment, it must also be practical. If we are forced to turn abroad to source food, particularly to import more fish, then that will actually have a detrimental effect on our efforts to reach climate change goals. It won't help us reach our climate ambitions if we end up relying on food that's been flown in from thousands of miles away. Food that might not be sourced as sustainably as the Scottish, Scottish fishing industry produces. As well as increasing the cost to consumers, we could end up hurting our own efforts to reduce carbon emissions if we end up leaving a larger carbon footprint by buying fish from overseas instead of using the brilliant catch that's sitting on our doorsteps. Tackling climate change and supporting our fishing industry must go hand in hand, and it is essential that the objectives, objectives of this SNP Green Coalition are evidence-based and give a clear direction, but does not come at the expense of producing healthy, climate-smart food with low carbon footprint right here on our doorstep. Clearly, there are tensions around the Butte House Agreement, as demonstrated by the catastrophic Clyde closure, of which Elaine White said... Um, was a, a, an acknowledgement that the gov government's approach had fallen short of um, what they had been expected. And Mary Gujan accepts that, you know, that, that she has learned lessons and that the co-management principles and practice 
um, sh perhaps should have been done, done better. And I think that Marie Goujon has apologised for that and has acknowledged that. But we do need to continue to learn those lessons and remember that every time we, we think about the the um, inflictions or the, the bureaucracy that we put on um, our Scottish fishermen. And later um, in an FOI, um, Mary Gujan actually did acknowledge that she felt um, uncomfortable with reviewing the ban and due to the arrangement with the Scottish Green Party. And another email showed Lorna Slater's involvement in signing off the ban. So we just need to be very, very careful when we're making decisions that are ideological rather than for practical reasons. Um, instead of you know, looking at the, the way that political decisions are made, um, perhaps it's best to do what's good for Scotland's climate change goals and our fishing industry. So I sincerely hope the government will reflect on this in its decision making. The unintended consequences of putting politics first could be, again, catastrophic catastrophic for our fishing um, fleet. What matters most is a good deal for Scottish fishing, not a good deal for the Greens. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, we wish the Scottish Government well in the annual negotiations for fishing opportunities for 2023. We hope they act in the national interest rather than um, the interest of the new coalition. We all want to secure the best outcome for Scotland right now. We also want to hear the Scottish Government um, that will not sell out fisheries for this, this coalition. They must listen um, to the voices of fishermen in coastal communities. They must recognise uh, the need for sensible coexistence that ensures a vibrant fishing sector to protect key low-carbon, high-protein food um, and the climate goals uh, that the fishing industry are con contributing to. Um, we must protect food security and, and energy security as not conflicting goals. They should be both pursued in union. Um, we will not be um, supporting the Labour amendment today because we agree with the SNP amendment, but unfortunately the Labour amendment, whilst most of it is acceptable, it doesn't acknowledge that what they're asking needs to have the voices of Scottish fishermen involved in that um, process to engage with them so that they can work together to improve their already improving um, fishing in a sustainable way and meeting climate change goals. So uh, sadly we won't, won't be supporting the Labour amendment today but thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call on Beatrice Wishart around six minutes, please, Ms Wishart. Thank you, presiding officer. I too want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all our fishermen and the work and the dangerous job that they do and all the work that the fishing industry does both offshore and onshore to put food on our tables. I also want to acknowledge the impact of ever-increasing energy costs on the industry. Last year I highlighted that an increasing number of fishery scientists were growing uneasy over the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, or ICES, stock assessments. ICES stated that it was willing to engage with the fishing industry to improve data collection and the way in which the data is interpreted. The fishing sector expressed concern about the time this may take and subsequent impacts such as bankruptcies for some fishers. There are still concerns about the accuracy, certainty and assumptions made in the data. But I am pleased though that there has been now a reversal in North Sea cod catches reflecting the observations of the fishing sector and catch recommendations have been increased by 82%. New official assessments from ISIS show key commercial stocks of cod and haddock at their highest level for decades. Without the reality of observations by the fishing sector being recognised sooner, the industry will continue to feel policy makers are distant and lack understanding. By contrast, and as the Cabinet Secretary has already referenced, mitigating the 30% cut in monkfish will be a priority in negotiations, as there are concerns that this cut is overly precautionary. On North East Atlantic mackerel, the Scottish Government's efforts to reduce unilateral total allowable catch are welcome to ensure that the UK fleet is not undermined in fishing this stock sustainably. In future, we will be building more at sea infrastructure, such as offshore winds, as we head towards net zero targets. These will need cables running to the shore and floating wind turbines will need cables to anchor them in place. Designating subsea cable corridors will allow certain routes for cables, allowing vessels to manoeuvre safely and fish in areas without danger to the crew or damage to cables. These designated routes will need to be created with all voices heard, including our at-sea renewable sector and our fishing fleet. 
I will say a little more about subsea cable corridors later. Members of the fishing sector have often raised with me their concerns about a lack of understanding by policy makers of the concerns of spatial squeeze. Scotland's seas are big, but they are also finite. The fishing sector will continue to help us on our route to net zero, providing quality, healthy, protein-rich food, just as it has done for centuries, but only if there is space in the seas to help achieve this. It's not as simple as a boat moving to a different part of the sea to catch the same fish, nor can one space be guaranteed to be forever a spawning spot. Unintended consequences of displacement could include greater gear conflict, fishing in pristine grounds, and inshore vessels being forced further offshore. Presiding officer, it is not a just transition to encourage and enable one sector to the significant detriment of others. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation June 22 report on spatial squeeze demonstrates different scenarios and as other members have highlighted, one forecasts that by 2050, over 50% 50 of Scotland's seas could be restricted for fishing. And that would be catastrophic for the fishing crew and their families involved in this industry. In a recent poll commissioned by the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, 80% of respondents said that both energy and food security are important, three quarters agreeing that the government should not squeeze out fishing. Both climate smart energy and a sector providing healthy, sustainable, low-carbon food can coexist. I would. I'm grateful to Beatrice Wishart for giving way. Does she agree with me that um, it is absolutely essential that when any new cable has been proposed to be laid underground in connection with the energy or other requirements that she mentions, it is essential that fishermen and their representatives are fully engaged and represent, represented right from the start, the very start, and that that engagement should continue unabated uh, and with complete engagement all throughout those negotiations, with all relevant information being shared with fishermen, because the absence of such engagement in some instances uh, has, according to my understanding, led to unnecessary difficulties arising, which perhaps could have been avoided if there had been that full engagement from the first place and thereafter throughout. Beatrice Wishart. I fully agree with uh, the uh, intervention from Fergus Ewing and I also agree that it should never be um, just a tick box exercise. Last month, this year, last month, Shetland suffered a telecommunications outage, and in a response letter I received from the Scottish Government, it was stated, and I quote, the incident was then caused by the primary cable being hit by a fishing trawler. That incident has serious consequences across Shetland. Digital phone lines down, internet down, mobile signal down, cash machines down, businesses forced to close, all demonstrating just how much we rely on technology. And it raises serious concerns about the safety implications for the crew aboard that vessel. But risks are only going to increase unless we act now to establish cable corridors around Shetland, as Shetland Fishermen's Association advocates, and our other coastal communities as we build more infrastructure at sea. Presiding officer, as I begin to bring my remarks to a close, I would once again like to put on record my concerns about the resourcing of Marine Scotland. We are increasingly asking more of the Scottish Government body and it will grow in importance as a consequence. We need to make sure we have the right amount and balance of staff, equipment and technology. We are relying on this body to ensure the biodiversity of our seas, the sustainable fishing of our seas and manage all the resources that our seas offer in helping us to reach our net, target, our net zero targets. I hope the Scottish Government can give us some reassurance about Marine Scotland's future today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Wishart. We will now move to the open debate, and it's disappointing to note that not all, every speaker who is seeking to speak in the open debate had the courtesy to listen to all the opening speeches. Uh, speeches of six minutes. We now have used up all the time in hand. I call Karen Adam to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Ms. Adam. Thank you, President Officer. I've probably mentioned a few times before in this chamber that my constituency has many coastal fishing communities which are embedded in integrity and there is a real pride in fishing culture and heritage. 
The Scottish Government brings a set of principles to the table of coastal negotiations aligned with that long-established good faith and integrity, and doing so as a well-regarded good global citizen. This debate on fishing negotiations comes at a time when leaders and citizens from around the globe just gathered in Egypt to take stock of efforts to preserve our planet for future generations. Sustainability is on all of us. It's our responsibility to take seriously the stewardship of the sea. The theme of sustainability and preservation of biodiversity flows through our negotiations and discussions, which is indeed a huge task. In Bampshire and Buckingham Coast, the role that our oceans and seas play is a part of our daily lives, but it's living ever closer to the real and obvious challenge of climate change. At the forefront of our negotiations is the understanding that fishers and processors in my constituency and others are fearful as to the future of an industry reeling from the Westminster perfect storm of Brexit, a cost of living crisis, economic chaos and spiralling energy costs, as well as an immigration policy that fails the industry, particularly in the labour constraints it upholds. Scottish Fishermen's Federation Chief Executive Elspeth Macdonald spoke for many when she said the Brexit deal on fisheries fell far short of what the industry had sought and what the UK Government had promised. Scottish White Fish Producers Association CEO Mike Park said it is clear for the offshore catching sector Brexit failed to deliver any benefits of being a coastal state. And Scottish Seafood Association CEO Jimmy Buchan said fishers had been badly let down. The Tory rhetoric of a sea of opportunity is indeed exposed as entirely false. I've spoken about the culture and heritage of the industry in Scotland, but we must also recognise the significant contribution that the industry adds to the economy. In 2021, fish and seafood exports were valued at £1 billion which is 60%, almost 60% of total Scottish food exports and employs some 15,000 people across Scotland. Marine Scotland acknowledges this valued contribution and in doing so invests back to support it. For example, around 14 million has been awarded to date in 21 and 22 across a range of projects, including supporting young fishers to enter the industry, enhancing sustainable aquaculture, protecting the marine environment and supporting Scotland's coastal communities with improved infrastructure and facilities. The strategy for the seafood sector announced in October highlighted ongoing work to monitor and manage the marine space so that consumers can have confidence in the sustainability of Scottish seafood. It detailed how the fishing and aquaculture sectors are being supported to remain internationally competitive and attract skills and talent to some of Scotland's most rural and coastal areas, despite the challenges of the post-Brexit trading environment. Yes, absolutely. Finlay Carson. I appreciate uh, you taking the intervention, but whilst there were some issues around uh, the, the new fisheries negotiation. Would you recognise that landings increased by 15 per cent between 2020 and 2021? Karen Adam? Yeah, I mean, increased landings are fantastic, but we've got to ensure that we've also got the labour onshore and processors able to, you know, to, to be able to cope with the landings there as well. And there's a lot of pressures there, and the industry is really feeling that. But yes, I know I, I agree with my colleague, it's, that is good news. The commitment to sustainable fisheries management is locked into our overarching fisheries management strategy and these negotiations will drive many of the new policies and management improvements that are planned over the period to 2030. The latest fisheries statistics show Scotland's sea fish and shellfish industry recovered in 2021 from the COVID-19 pandemic but has not yet returned to pre-Brexit levels. As I said last month, this comprehensive and long-term plan has been put together with the voice of the local fishing industry at its heart, and the same is true of the coastal state negotiations. This gives Scotland's world-class sustainable fishing industry security and a prospect of a bright future. In our current programme for government, we committed to publishing our approach to the blue economy through an action plan. That recognises the importance of Scotland's marine space and marine sectors as national assets, and they are critical to meeting our ambitions for sustainable stewardship of the marine environment. 
The action plan will be underpinned by a vision and will provide a framing and ambition for Scotland's marine man management, po management policies, strategies and plans, including the fisheries management strategy and coastal negotiations. Our vision for Scotland's blue economy is clear that the actions that are required to steward our marine environment sustainably cannot be delivered in isolation. I am confident that by working in partnership through our co-management groups, we can deliver the best outcomes for Scotland's marine environment, our seafood sector and coastal communities. Although we might be facing challenges, we do what this government does best, and that is to stand up for, always promote and protect Scotland's interests. Until Scotland regains its independence and EU membership, I am sure the Scottish Government will continue to be actively involved in the coastal state negotiations, in which it will play a key and active role in ensuring the protection of Scotland's interests. In conclusion, the outcomes that we seek at the annual fisheries negotiations are aligned to that vision. We are not looking for outcomes that will benefit a few or that will betray a whole industry, as the Brexit deal has done. We are committed to delivering the right deal for Scotland. Thank you, Ms. Adam. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, Ms. Grant is joining us remotely. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This debate is an annual occurrence where the Scottish Government sets down its approach to those annual negotiations. And they must have key principles in mind when approaching the negotiations, principles that are highlighted in the Scottish Labour Amendment today. Fish are a finite resource, but are not confined by borders. Therefore, all states must approach negotiations in the clear knowledge that they must all manage this finite resource, a resource that must be nurtured and managed for ourselves and also for future generations. We must make that a key principle for those fishing in Scottish water and use our influence to extend that principle as far as we can internationally. To do this, we must fish at sustainable levels and must be guided by the science. To have buy-in for those decisions, fishers must also be involved and in the gathering of the information required to inform that science and have their knowledge and experience recognised as well. Too often, our approach has been top-down rather than collaborative. And how often have we heard fishers say there is a lot of a species available where the scientists are saying the opposite? Both cannot be right, and therefore there needs to be much more collaborative work. Scientists need to see what fishers see and vice versa, and only then can we build trust in the collaboration required to build a sustainable fishery. And it's in everyone's interests that we have a sustainable fishery for the industry, for our coastal communities and for us all. We must invest in research and development of selective gear. Most of our fisheries are mixed and we need to try and find ways to allow the fishing of plentiful stocks while avoiding bycatch of species that are scarce. I have, every time I've spoken in this debate, talked about bycatch and how we must ensure it is landed and used under a regime that does not encourage its pursuit. The regime does not need to be complicated but it needs to ensure that there is no waste. Economically, fishing is crucial to our coastal communities. There is an opportunity to increase the jobs in the that the sector provides currently by adding value at the quay side. Too often we see lorries lined up the quay to whisk fish straight to markets abroad, missing the opportunity to add value locally. And we have conflicting issues here because we lack a workforce to do this in many of those coastal communities and boat owners tell us that they have challenges recruiting crew locally and they struggle to recruit from abroad due to immigration restrictions. And this is because many of these ports are in some of the most picturesque areas of Scotland, areas where young people are being forced out because they can't get housing. The fishing industry does not pay its workforce in a way that fits with the requirements of banks and building societies. It can be very lucrative, but it does not pay weekly or monthly salaries. Pay depends on weather and catch. People can make a good living at sea, but we need to ensure that they can use those earnings to buy themselves a home. Otherwise, we lose them. 
Lack of housing for young people leads to depopulation and dependence on foreign crew. It also means that communities miss out on the economic benefit that processing work can bring to the area. Small communities who have a degree of fish processing can support more jobs on land as they do at sea. The Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust in their briefing for the debate made the point that inshore fishing must never be overlooked. They ask how the Scottish Government will integrate inshore fisheries into regional marine planning, something we're still waiting for. Inshore fisheries are the linchpin of the economy for small coastal communities. They land locally and process locally. This part of the industry must be recognised and assisted and developed. In order to capitalise on fishing, we need to ensure that all Scottish board boats land at Scottish ports. Tony Mackay's report on fishery states Scottish vessels landed £393 million, 70% of their fish in Scotland in 2021. The other landings were in Norway, around 20%, Denmark, 4%, the rest of the UK, 4%, Ireland, 1%, and other countries, around 1%. This highlights that Scotland lost out on almost a third of Scottish boat landings. And while non-Scottish boats also land here, that only makes up for about 3% of the total landings when you remove the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, fisheries management is the responsibility of Scottish ministers. It is their responsibility to ensure that Scotland reaps the full benefits of this industry. Over the last decade I've spoken in this debate and I've continued to press and raise some points over and over again. Investment in gear, listening to both fishers and scientists, putting sustainability at the heart of negotiations. And yet this government seems incapable of carrying out those core purposes. I hope they listen now and make progress. If they do, our young people will find careers in a successful industry and our coastal communities will flourish. Thank you, Ms Grant. I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Jamie Halker johnson up to six minutes. Please, Dr Allen. Thank you, President Officer. The ongoing coastal states negotiations are of the utmost importance to Scotland's fishing industry. And as others have pointed out, uh, the results of these negotiations will dictate the industry's short-term opportunities, as well as fishing's future in the longer term, aiming to secure the sustainable management of fish stocks in the seas that surround us. In a country with as rich a coastline as Scotland, it is little wonder that fishing remains a key part of our economy, not least in constituencies such as my own. During the ongoing negotiations with neighbouring coastal nations over the strategic management objectives and approaches for shared fish stocks, uh, the Scottish Government is rightly, I believe, working to achieve the best possible outcome for Scotland's fishers, coastal communities, the seafood sector as a whole in particular, and for our environment. And it is vital that the Scottish Government continues to respond to the key challenges facing Scotland's fishing industry. I could name many, but to name a couple of recent ones, uh, the leap in fuel prices over the past year and the impact, as others have pointed out, of labour shortages. It is also important to recognise that the needs of the West Coast, such as in my own constituency, can differ radically from the needs specific to the East Coast or the Northern Isles fishing industries. Inshore fisheries in particular and the produce that they export uh, play a vital part in the local economy of the islands. Uh, there remains a strong demand for the export of high quality Scottish fish and seafood, accounting for an impressive 63% of the UK's total seafood exports last year. But, presiding officer, all the available evidence shows us that most Scots see Brexit in fishing, as in so many other areas of our lives, as an extraordinary act of national self-harm to the UK's economy, hampering our ability to efficiently trade with our closest neighbours. A small number of, uh, sorry, a number of small seafood businesses in my own constituency uh, have uh, expressed grave doubts about whether. It's practical now to uh, export to the EU altogether due to the increase in uh, paperwork delays and costs that they've experienced since Brexit. Brexit has, of course, created a myriad of other issues. The shortage of labour uh, across the country is something almost every industry is having to contend with, uh, and fishing is no exception. 
The UK Home Office, I must say, however, Presiding Officer, seems uh, to continue to refuse to engage its common sense uh, on this matter as it clings to its damaging anti-immigration rhetoric at all costs while jobs across countless sectors go uh, unfilled. This, uh, this affects the long-term viability of many businesses, not least in the fishing industry, crushing the potential growth that uh, the UK Government insists they are working to create. For example, the requirement um, for uh, overseas labour on many types of fishing vessel is now the norm, uh, and much as we want to recruit within Scotland, it is uh, increasingly needed. And following uh, immigration regulation amendments after Brexit, transit visas have uh, begun to be regularly used to employ fishers, uh, mostly from Ghana and the Philippines on boats around Scotland. The Home Office is now closing the loophole which allows these visas to be used in this way, uh, as they see it, a, a loophole, and in response to allegations uh, uh, more significantly of human rights uh, abuse uh, aboard a handful of UK fishing vessels where transit visas have been in use. Would Dr. Allen agree on this point? Yes. Thank you. Um, in wholeheartedly agreeing with uh, Dr. Allen's detailed description of the failings of the Home Office in this regard, is he aware of the speech that was made very recently by the leader of the Labour Party in England, Keir Stammer, who appeared to uh, cast doubt on whether immigration was a good thing and make it clear that his party appears to be opposed to immigration, something which is really per particularly damaging and unhelpful to the fishing industry which Dr Allen has championed in his part of Scotland? Uh, Alistair Allen? It, well, it, it remains a mystery, as it remains uh, uh, clearly to the member and to many others, I'm sure, um, what the, the Labour Party's uh, position going forward is on, uh, on uh, Labour from other countries, uh, or indeed what their, their position uh, might be more, uh, more, more broadly on Brexit itself. But uh, in addressing these issues uh, in the time of, of available, presiding officer, I just want to say that uh, I hope the Scottish Government will continue to proactively engage with the, the UK Government on these issues. But uh, the labour force issue is just one example of the avalanche of challenges facing Scotland's fishing industry uh, at present. And the, these issues provide a context for the negotiations that we're speaking about today. Uh, these pressures affect all sizes of fishing enterprises and mean that the outcome of this year's coastal states negotiations has never been more important. Uh, in, concluding, in concluding, presiding officer, uh, I want to say that when it comes to protecting our marine environment and ensuring the continued viability of the fishing sector in Scotland's coastal communities, it is not a question of either or. We must uh, work to find the correct balance uh, for both the fishing industry and for the environment. Uh, and the key role of fishing in Scotland's rural and coastal economies must be preserved and encouraged and our marine environment protected. It is my hope that this year's coastal states negotiations are an opportunity to be proactive to ensure the long-term sustainability uh, of our seas fish stocks and of our fishing industry. Thank you, Dr Allen. I now call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Jenny Minto. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Halker-Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's relationship with the sea has for centuries been an important one. We are a maritime nation and have depended on the sea for trade, food and defence throughout our history. And the fishing sector is disproportionately significant in my own region and in the north of our country. Fishing is not only valued for its economic benefits and its continuing role in providing fresh and sustainable food, but also for its cultural position it holds in many of our coastal communities. My region of the Highlands and Islands is host to many varied forms, from the for, uh, forms that of the wider fishing sector takes here in Scotland. And I was pleased to see that the new Scotland Minister John Lamont's recent visit to Shetland involved engaging with local fishing interests. The United Kingdom is now, as we are all aware, an independent coastal state. That has been a positive marker for our fishing industry. We have, for, after so long, finally emerged from the CFP, and we are still in the early days of adapting to that renewed status. But that's not to say that we should allow opportunities now, opportunities to create a more sustainable and workable sector to go unharnessed. Part of that independent coastal state status involves being responsible for our relationship with other international actors. Most notably, the UK Government has concluded agreements with Norway and the Faroe Islands, and also with the EU through the Trade and Cooperation Agreement process. On this side of the Chamber, we have urged cooperative working between Scotland's two governments in standing up for Scotland's interest internationally. 
and while I don't expect an end to the sort of knockabout politicking that issues like this can raise, I think people, whether in this Parliament or out working on Scotland's seas, ought to expect that both governments will be working positively together to build more effective arrangements for the sector. The... Yes, I will. Jenny Minto. I thank the member for taking that intervention. Um, to avoid the knockabout politics, I wondered if the member would agree with me that the UK government has only provided Scotland with £14 million for the fishing industry as opposed to what the EMF fund would have uh, given of £62 million. Jamie Hawkins Johnson. Um, I thank the member for that. I mean, we do talk about, I, I was literally talking about trying to avoid the knockabout politics and we get knockabout politics, which is, um, which is, which is very, very similar. And I'm, pre I'm, sure, I'm sure in the spirit that it was asked, the question, the question that was asked, I don't imagine when the, the member goes and speaks to fishermen around her constituency, they're desperately calling to go back into the common fisheries policy, but she may argue otherwise. The coastal states negotiations are, of course, one part of that, and it's positive to see the Scottish Government play a significant role in that process. This is a period where there are real pressures on our fishing fleet and on seafood producers, as well as others in the sector. A positive outcome will be more important than ever, and I note the commitment to collaborative engagement in the Scottish Government's motion today, and that's welcome, and I look forward to seeing more of that going forward. Because, of course, there are other areas of concern for the industry, where more work with the sector needs uh, and will be more invaluable. Earlier this year, the Scottish Government set out a fairly high-level blue economy vision aimed at securing the future health of the sector. But to realise that vision, there will have to be practical actions here in Scotland. And as already been raised today, I note in particular the, section, the sector's increasing concerns about how, both now and in the future, fishing industries are not squeezed out with competing demands in our seas. It was a concern raised with me by the Shetland Fishermen's Association when I met with them in the summer and by others in the sector. Earlier this year, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation and the National Federation of Fishing, Fishermen's Organisations outlined just some of these concerns in a joint report, noting the expected pressures that will arise in coming decades. The importance of offshore renewables, not just onshore, offshore wind, but also emergent wave and tidal technologies are significant. And I don't believe anyone here is seriously suggesting that these offshore renewable projects are not increasingly important or worthwhile, or that they shouldn't be a vital part of the government's energy strategy. That is, however, a call, a call for these projects to be designed with fishing in mind and with serious consultation with fishing interests. Because as the SFF has pointed out, when done properly, fish is a sustainable and low-carbon food source and will have a continuing role in building our food security and can be a contrib contributor to contributor to sustainability goals. But more than that, it's an iconic industry in my region, an industry that has a great deal of experience in working with the sea, one whose voice must be heard on the future of offshore planning and management. And on the issue of management, I will turn briefly to some of the other questions raised. It's worth noting that the 2020 Future Fisheries Strategy supported robust compliance in the sector and a positive future built on mutual respect. These words were welcomed by many. The realities of this government's role in fishing are managing the legitimate interests of competing users within a set area. However, the realities of effective enforcement have been quite different. We appreciate the marine, that Marine Scotland cannot be omnipresent, but too often it seems little more than a paper tiger, unable to intervene or effectively penalise unlawful and unfair activities. Gear conflicts have been an area of long-standing issue. The Scottish Government, to its credit, has looked and taken action here, but more recently, enforcement has been found wanting. Taking action would not only protect the legitimate interests of those who work and earn their livelihoods from our seas, but also have the benefit of providing for protection of our marine environments where we have decided they require it. Presiding officer, we should be proud of our fishing industry, and governments should be working hard to fight for their interests. Scottish seafood has a global reach. And I was speaking with representatives from Heathrow Airport only last week about just how significant air freight capacity has been to my region's ability to export its produce around the world. It serves as a reminder that we have a highly marketable product with a long tradition of being utilised. We should not forget the more positive position that we find ourselves in outside of the common fisheries policy. And I urge the Scottish Government to resist suggestions that returning to the CFP in one way or another would be a good thing 
or worse still, a fair trade-off for other interests. We can harness the advantages of our newfound status as an independent coastal state, and it is reasonable for our fishermen to expect that government, at all levels, will be out batting for their interests. Thank you, Mr Hawker Johnson. I now call Jenny Minto to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to speak in this debate on Scotland's approach to the 2022 coastal state negotiations to achieve the Scottish Government's vision for Scotland to be a world-class fishing nation delivering responsible and sustainable fisheries management. I grew up in the East Nuke of Fife. My father was one of the local accountants, and a large part of his job in Einster was supporting fishers, their families, and the businesses that had grown up around the fishing industry. He was also director of the Scottish Fisheries Museum, a role he was extremely proud to hold. He oft quoted Walter Scott, it's no fish you're buying, it's men's lives. The history of Scottish fisheries is traced uh, in the museum's displays and artefacts, the boom and bust, the innovation and adaption, but also how the involvement of the whole community is integral to its success. And now with the economic pressures of Brexit, COVID, cost of living and war in Ukraine, alongside the twin impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss, it is these attributes of innovation and adaption that are needed now more than ever. The Scottish Government's strategy for coastal states negotiations are influenced by high quality science. Visiting SAMS at Dunstaffnage, just outside Oban in my constituency, I learnt about the research work they do in marine science. They suggest that the main reason that we still know more about the surface of the moon than most of our marine environment is because of the difficulty, danger and expense of gathering ocean data, especially from extreme marine environments. But modern technology increasingly allows us to make these important observations, and this exciting technology is being led in Scotland. And next door to SAMS is the European Marine Science Park, which is home to around 10 marine sector companies active in a broad range of commercial marine activities. For example, Tritonia are a diving and underwater research company offering specialist diving services in support of a range of commercial and advanced scientific operations. As Morag Goodfellow of High said earlier this year, Argyle's rich marine resource has created and maintained significant economic opportunity for generations, and these latest company expansions demonstrate how innovation and technology is continuing to drive the maritime economy in the region. But we also have generations of fishers working in our seas, like those working in Argyle and Butte from Campbelltown, Tarbert, Oban, and many, many more smaller ports. The Clyde Fishermen's Association suggests that utilising data that local fishing boats um, can pick up could provide uh, an addition to government science vessels. In June this year, the Clyde Fishermen's Trust published. Finlay Carson. Then, Finch, would you agree with me that it's going to take some time for, for fishermen in your, or fishers in your community to, to get confidence and, and trust back in the Scottish Government after uh, the recent decisions on cod and herring stocks? Jenny Minto. Thank the member for that intervention and I would point out that um, relationships um, change all the time and what I am working hard on and what the Cabinet Secretary has also said that she is working hard is on ensuring that these relationships um, are brought to the best way that they can be. So thank you. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, in this year, the Clyde Fisherman's Trust published a vision, the Clyde Fishery. It is ambitious, it introduces new goals and ideas, it offers practical solutions. It supports the best possible outcomes for fishers, the seafood sector, coastal communities and the environment through a collaborative and co-management approach. In the 1800s, Loch Fine skiffs were developed in the Clyde area, but their efficiency was dependent on an uncontrollable factor, the power of the wind. Now that we can control and harness the wind as renewable energy. In Trondheim in Norway in 2015, the first electrically powered inshore fishing vessel was built and now Fisheries Innovation Scotland are coordinating changes that may be possible for the Scottish fleet. Innovation and adaption to ensure sustainable fisheries and communities. Telling the stories of our fishing communities, the Fisheries Museum shows how localness was taken over by big business as technology improved, catches increased. Um, we now need to use that technology not just to harvest the sea, but to ensure fishing is sustainable and perhaps revisit localness. The coastal state and regional fisheries management organisation negotiations are all part of this. Getting this right will protect the environmental, economic and social outcomes by supporting a move to maximum sustainable yield. 
The vision for the Clyde proposes a ring-fenced quota reserved from the national allocation, which is directly overseen by government with an independent auditing scientific body advising on removals. It suggests changing the 30-year-old fixed quota allocations. It proposes mixed fisheries system informed by the science, but also fishermen's observations. This would allow inshore communities to see fairer quota allocations and give an opportunity to diversify. Improved local port infrastructure would also help. Presiding officer, to finish. I said at the start of my speech that the Scottish Fisheries Museum also highlights the importance to the wider community around fisherfolk. Nothing has changed. To ensure our fishing is sustainable and the high quality whitefish and shellfish that our seas are home to survive, communities need to work together. As already been mentioned, the RAIN Committee held a roundtable evidence session on inshore fisheries in October. The session included stakeholders from both the fishing and environmental sectors and was designed to support the Committee's understanding of key issues affecting Scotland's inshore fisheries to inf help inform our future work programme. Our discussion ranged from the spatial squeeze within our seas to just transition to workforce concerns, all the big subjects. It was a good start and I look forward to building on the foundations of this session. By working together, as the Government motion states, we can achieve the best possible outcome for Scotland's fishers, the wider seafood sector, coastal communities and the environment through a collaborative and co-management approach with all stakeholders. Thank you, Ms Minto. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Up to six minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, those researching family in East Lothian will very likely come across a fishing affiliation. In 2012, I had my family tree researched. On my papa's side of the family, there were four generations of fishermen, and possibly before that, two. Fisher Row, Preston Pans, Kakenzie, Port Seton, North Berwick and Dunbar are all existing harbours that have been used for fishing to varying degrees. East Lothian has a strong fishing tradition. Most early fishermen did not stray far from the shallow coastal shores, fishing for seasonal flat flounders and coal fish that bred in large shoals amongst kelp and seaweed. They were caught, dried, stored and make an ideal food supply for small communities that kept communities going for years. The Dutch were great leaders of the herring industry in the 16th and 17th century and held monopoly over the North Sea and greatly influenced the Scots. Negotiations over fishing were taking place even then. Fishing in East Lothian continued with varying success over the late 19th and 20th century and still continues today, but on a smaller scale. Fishing has, without doubt, made a considerable mark on the East Lothian way of life. Dunbar, my own hometown, is, is now home port to some 29 fishing vessels, varying in size between 6 to 15 metres long. The larger vessels concentrate in prawn trawling and the remainder usually, usually lay creels for lobster, brown crabs and velvet crabs. Different bait is used depending on what species is targeted. Here in 2023, we are discussing coastal state and regional fisheries management organisations with the EU, Norway and the Faroe Isles. The outcome of these, these negotiations will be pivotal in providing fishing opportunities to the Scottish fishing industry and ensure that sustainable management of fish stocks in the longer term supports the efforts to achieve the best possible outcome for the wider seafood sector and our coastal communities. Let's look at the context in fishing in Scotland today and the history of the last two years. The Tory Brexit sellout of Scotland's fishing sector has not helped build trust in the integrity of the UK Government having Scotland's fisheries interests at heart. Throughout the Brexit process, Westminster Tory governments set up Scotland's fishing communities as a bargaining chip in the Brexit negotiations. From the start, the UK Government set up Scotland's uh, uh, fisheries as I said, uh, as seen as expendable. A uh, direct quote from Boris Johnson. Contrary to the Brexiteers' promises of less red tape and bureaucracy, the Tory Brexit cause is still adding a pile of extra bureaucracy for exporters. Yes? Jamie Harker Johnson. Thank you very much. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Does he um, believe that fishermen, whether in his area or across Scotland, want to go back into the CFP as his party would have? Paul McLennan. I think there are mixed views on that. I think the key thing, though, is just. I think, I think the key thing. I think the key thing, if the member listen to me, the key thing is they want trust in their politicians. They certainly didn't get, they certainly didn't get in the Tories in the Brexit discussions, that's for sure. And, and indeed, when Scott, Scott, Seafood Scotland warned in a very short time, and these are direct quotes, we could see the destruction of a centuries-old market which contributes significantly to the Scottish economy. Direct quote. Other direct quote. Uh, Elspeth Macdonald at SFF. The SFF made it clear in the view that Brexit dealing fisheries fell far short of what the industry had sought and what the UK Government had promised, what the UK Government had promised, and I've taken one already. 
Scottish White Producers Association uh, Mike Park said it's clear for the offshore catching sector, Brexit has failed to deliver any benefits of being a coastal state. As I said, it damages the context of any, any of the negotiations that the UK Government lead is trusting and supporting Scottish, Scottish uh, fishermen. In regards to spatial squeeze, and that has been mentioned by a few members, I recently met with the RSPB and visited the Bass Rock with them. At that meeting, they discussed and we discussed the report Powering Healthy Seas, Accelerating Nature Positive Onshore Wind. This was a collaborative effort between them, the fishing industry and conservation groups. I am glad to say at this stage Scottish Renewables no, I've taken one already and I'm conscious of my time. No, I'm glad to say at this stage Scottish Renewables are talking down with RSPB and fishing groups at this stage about that report. It spells out what is needed to make the shift to nature positive for offshore wind, integrating marine recovery and resilience for our seabirds and fishing stock into energy development. So what should the Scottish Government's negotiation strategy and Scotland's approach to the, the negotiations be? What should they be influenced by? High quality science, we've heard that before, and wider policy objectives, including socio-economic implications, are key. The Scottish Government has already stated its negotiation approach is underpinned by a set of guiding principles that will remain consistent and need to progress towards good environmental process. We need to fully comply with the range of international conventions and obligations, in particular the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea inform management decisions using best available scientific advice and obviously speaking to fishermen as well and ensure fish foreign vessels fishing in Scottish waters meet the same high standards applied to Scottish vessels in Scottish waters. And of course the government will ensure that our vessels meet these standards when fishing elsewhere. Departure from the EU has changed the international context in which we operate but the Scottish Government is determined to continue to play a full and key role in supporting and delivering international fisheries management. In their briefing for today, the Sustainable Insurers Fisheries Trust touched upon the requirement to adapt to changes arising from the biodiversity and climate crises. They raised, they raised that they think insured fishery will have to adapt to the increasing competition for space and inshore waters. This transition will inevitably, in their opinion, lead to the displacement of certain fishing activities in specific areas. And I'm asking if the Minister could uh, touch on that, the Cabinet Secretary could touch on that, and are summing up today. Is any officer in conclusion, fishing communities have long been a part of East Lothian and Scottish coastal communities. Brexit has damaged the sector. The Scottish Government and its approach to coastal states negotiations will help our fishermen thrive, protect our environment and ensure sustainable fishing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Siobhan Brown. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you. Presiding officer, we are deep in a climate and nature emergency. The disappointment of COP27 reverberates around the planet as we look set to cross over the safe limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is the context we need to keep fully in our minds when shaping and scrutinizing legislation and debating topics such as these coastal states negotiations. I'd like to thank the Scottish Government and their negotiators for their efforts to achieve the best possible outcome for Scotland's fishers and the seafood sector, coastal communities and the environment. We are all aware that they are working within constraints, including economic challenges exacerbated by Brexit, the war in Ukraine and the after effect of COVID-19. Of course, ministers must balance the economic interests of the fishing industry with the long-term sustainability of our seas and fish stocks. But for too long, the balance has been off. If we're serious about achieving the best possible economic, social and environmental outcomes, the balance needs to shift. Under the Butte House Agreement between the Scottish Government and the Greens, we are starting to see a rebalancing. We are working to deliver fisheries management measures for marine protected areas and developing a suite of highly protected marine areas that will protect at least 10% of our seas. The Scottish Government is taking steps to incentivise the use of selective fishing gear and low impact techniques. And I welcome the call for ministers to report yearly on this. The measures will be vital for restoring the health of our seas, but the benefits will be undermined if we don't also set quotas that protect and restore our fish stocks. The UK Fisheries Act, I've got a lot to get through. I'm just going to keep on going if you don't mind. The UK Fisheries Act sets objectives that the four administrations are required to pursue. The sustainability objective includes the imperative do not overexploit marine stocks. The precautionary objective is to enable biomass levels to recover until stocks can produce maximum sustainable yield. And the ecosystems, I'm sorry, I'm not, I've got plenty to get through at the moment. And the ecosystems objective requires that human pressures, including fishing, must uh, be kept 
to levels compatible with good environmental status. The Scottish Government's blue economy vision reflects these objectives and recognises that we can and must thrive within the planet's sustainable limits. But in order to fulfil that vision by 2045, we need to change the way we approach quota neg negotiations now. Scottish waters account for 13% of European, Europe's seas. So although we are not an independent party in the negotiations, we have quite a responsibility and opportunity to influence how quota is set, particularly for certain species. Presiding officer, by way of example, I will focus on one stock of critical concern, west of Scotland, cod. From Cape Wrath up around the Faroes and down to the Clyde, west of Scotland cod has declined by 92% since the ICES started issuing advice on, in 1981. The biomass is below the level where the stock is at risk and the stock is at risk of collapse. That's why the scientific advice is to set total allowable catch for this species at zero. But the UK and EU have set the catch limit above scientific advice every year for 35 years. Bottom trawlers argue that they need quota for this stock because they catch it as bycatch and they don't want to breach the landing obligation. They want a higher quota so they can use all their quota for other species without reaching the limit on west of Scotland cod first. But it shouldn't be acceptable to exceed scientific advice just because it will alleviate the so-called choke in the fishery. The maximum sustainable yield is supposed to be a limit to keep fishing pressures to a sustainable level as required by the Fisheries Act. By not staying, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep on going as I've said, I've got limited time and plenty more to say. By not staying within this limit, we are prioritizing short-term economic gain over long-term stock recovery and ecosystem health. Scotland is not solely responsible for West Scotland cod, but we have a good opportunity to influence negotiations on it. DEFRA listens to Scotland's position on this, so why don't we advocate for an approach that would ensure the stock recovers rather than sign up to the same approach that has failed to bring about significant recovery since the early 1990s? Of course, we must consider the socio-economic impact of suddenly setting a zero catch limit. We don't want our fishers to face a cliff edge, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Why not set a commitment to recover West of Scotland cod stocks by 20% each year and advocate for total allowable catch and quota to be based on that? Sadly, West of Scotland cod is just one of many stocks that are overfished the latest Scottish Marine Assessment found that 46% of evaluated stock were below the level, level capable of producing maximum sustainable yields. Rebuilding fish stocks to this level could allow the UK to land an extra 442,000 tonnes of fish each year. With Scotland contributing 61% of the UK fishing industry's economic output, this would deliver significant benefit to fisheries and the rural economies they support. Our seas are the, great, the last great common for Scotland. Fish are a public asset recognised under UK case the law. About if to we... Sorry, what? It, I, I'm going to keep on going. I... If, we if we surveyed the Scottish people, I bet they wouldn't want the public assets in our seas to be overexploited until they can't recover. They'd expect the Scottish Government to ensure those assets are managed responsibly. To wind up, presiding officer, yes, if we uh, you get are over time, Ms. Burgess, so please do conclude now. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Burgess. Uh, we are short of time now. Um, I, I would call next Siobhan Brown to be followed by Mercedes Vialba. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's fish are a national asset to our naturally wealthy country. In 2019, 70% of Scottish seafood exports to the EU were worth over £770 million. And in 2019, seafood, seafood accounted to 57% of Scotland's overall food exports and had a total value of £1.02 billion. 
With Scotland only 8% of the UK's population, Scottish vessels accounted for 61% of the value and 67% of the tonnage of all landings by UK vessels in 2021. And in my own constituency in South Ayrshire, the industry employs roughly 215 people and is worth 11.6 million. Scotland is a major fishing nation, which is internationally recognised, and we need to ensure that we do everything to protect this important industry. Remember that big red bus that was going to save our UK $350 million a week to invest in the NHS? Well, another very fishy story by the Tories was that the Brexit would be a sea of opportunity for the Scottish fishing industry. This is yet and very unlikely to fruition. Brexit has been disastrous for the Scottish fishing industry. To end, the end of the UK Brexit discussions concluded that a trade and cooperation agreement on Christmas Eve at 2020 did not deliver on the promises, particularly on the uplift of all the quota shares made by the UK government. And following the departure from the EU on the 31st of January 2020, the UK is now an independent coastal state, as we all know, and the Scottish Government, as part of the UK delegation, plays an active role in ensuring that Scotland's interests are protected. And it's really important that we listen to the industry. I have a fish exporter based in my constituency, and with an extra £5,000 a week added to his weekly cost due to Brexit administration, he says his business is no longer viable. I've met with local fishermen in my constituency. Brexit, lack of staff and cost of living crisis and fuel prices. Yes. Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. W would you welcome the fact that the trade and cooper uh, cooperation agreement agreed in December 2020 will increase the amount of EU quota uh, uh, being uh, transferred to Scotland of 25% of the existing EU quota? So surely that's a positive uh, move forward. Thank you for your scripted question. Um, I'll get to that further down in my, in my speech. Um, I've also met with local fishermen, and times are really extremely tough for this once thriving industry. Their existence is in real jeopardy, and time is running out to salvage the remains of this valuable, our valuable fishing communities before they are lost for good. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for recently visiting a local Ayrshire fishing company with myself to hear about the challenges that they face and also the fascinating work and the wealth of experience behind this industry. And I know that she's meeting the, the fishermen on the Clyde shortly again um, to continue the positive engagement. We need to look at ways in which we can support this industry as it is so important to our Scottish economy. And today's motion by the Cabinet Secretary highlights all the ongoing negotiation with our international partners to ensure the best possible possible outcome for us Scottish fishers. Now, I know the Scottish Government's negotiating strategy and priorities are influenced by high-quality science and take into account the wider policy objectives and socio-economic implications, but can I ask that consideration is also given to utilise local fishing boats as reference fleets. Without accurate science, knowledge of local stocks can be limited. And in the Clyde specifically, it should be noted that boats are recording temperatures on the seafloor of 13 degrees this month. In recent years, it's been eight degrees, which is still very high in comparison to previous years. And cod generally spawn in temperatures of four to seven degrees, according to scientists. So climate change is having an impact on the industry and no local knowledge is so valuable. Just one other issue I'd like to highlight is with the climate change is fishing safety. Climate change is also affecting sea temperatures and the summer predicting more volatile weather and ageing vessels will struggle to operate safely in such conditions and can't be retrofitted to accommodate hybrid engines or alternative fuels. And this is an issue which is going to affect many of our fishermen moving forward. On the Clyde, there has been a strong interest in increased prawn access, and it has been acknowledged that the reduced nephrops fleet has been largely, largely due to age, lack of crew, impacts of Brexit and COVID, and recent closures. Increased access to prawn stock may help to revitalise and replenish the coastal fleet, which has been reduced in Scotland in the past few years. And one thing I'd like to highlight also is that the Clyde fleet have been particularly hard hit in relation to access to crew and enforcement of the transit visas has now been in place for over a year in this region only, and this has led to regional disproportional opportunities as Northern Ireland have continued to fish in the Clyde with full transit visa crew, while the Arclyde boats have been tied up. 
The Clyde Fishing Association are deeply concerned with the level of fishing boats are now dwindling at a more rapid rate on the Clyde than anywhere else in Scotland, and any consideration to support to diversify would be greatly appreciated. And in, in true in my constituency, 20 years ago there were 70 boats, and now there's only six. The factories in Eyre, Kilkeel, Glasgow and Lanarkshire are seeing a demand in the nephrops domestically and in the EU, and, but they just do not have the volume of fishing boats or the staff to support the demand or the market, and this is really becoming critical for factories and fishing communities. And the Clyde fishermen wanted this raised so that to the negotiating team are fully aware of all the challenges that they face. If you could please conclude, Ms Brown. Sure. Scotland's commercial fleeting, fishing fleet and sea fisheries are significant contributors to Scotland's rural and coastal economies. The commercial fishing industry contributes significantly to Scotland's food and drink economy, and in particular playing an important part in remote and potentially fragile communities. We need to pre preserve this industry for Thank you, Ms Brown. To come. I must ask you to conclude. Thank you. I call Mercedes Vialba to be followed by Jim Fairley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate because in the wake of COP27, many campaigners are concerned about the lack of significant progress internationally towards achieving both net zero and environmental targets. So today's debate is a welcome opportunity for the Scottish Government to set out what it hopes to see emerge from the upcoming coastal states negotiations. And there is much in the government's motion which we support, including the need to improve opportunities for Scotland's fishing industry and to ensure sustainable management of fish stocks in the long term. But today's debate also allows us to assess the progress that we're making here in Scotland in delivering a more sustainable fishing industry. And as my colleague Colin Smith has already outlined, there is still much progress to be made by the Scottish Government. Scottish Labour's five tests have set out clear objectives around sustainability, fair quota distribution and support for socially, economically and environmentally beneficial fisheries. And I'd urge the Scottish Government to work towards achieving these. Because for too long, Scotland's seas have been in a state of decline. And this must be reversed. And while targets are missed and pledges remain unfulfilled, we will not deliver the marine recovery which is so vitally needed. But why is it so important that we reverse the decline of our seas and promote marine recovery? It's clearly important to the rural communities and coastal communities in Scotland who greatly rely on the fishing industry for jobs and their local economies. And by redistributing quotas, we can ensure that everyone in our coastal communities reap the benefits of our national resource by tying quota access to fisheries that provide local fair work using low impact measures, we can restore our marine environment while strengthening our coastal communities, all of which will contribute to repopulation and preservation of an important part of our cultural heritage. Can I get the time back? I'm afraid there is no time in hand. This I'm afternoon. sorry, I'm, I haven't got time. Um, but if we fail to grasp the opportunity to use existing mechanisms like quotas to support Scottish fishers, it's these coastal communities which will pay the price for our political inaction. And just as Scotland's mining communities suffered serious economic hardship, which still scars us today, so the loss of fishing jobs and opportunities has been and will continue to be devastating for our coastal communities. But it's not just coastal communities who need to be concerned about the decline of our seas. It's all of us. Failure to address issues like quota allocation, support for more sustainable fishing methods and the landing of catches abroad will have impacts felt across Scotland. Whether it's the harm that certain fishing methods cause to our marine environment or the loss of fish for food supplies or the breakup of our coastal communities, the responsibility falls on all of us to ensure Scotland's fishing industry is supported and sustainable because without such a fishing industry, we will not reverse the decline of Scotland's seas or deliver marine recovery. So, presiding officer, I've spoken of the need for Scotland to have a fishing industry which is both supported and sustainable. And there are a number of issues which I believe the Scottish Government must address to make this a reality. 
Scotland's fishers currently find themselves locked in competition due to the lack of spatial planning. Poor spatial planning is fatally undermining the future prospects of many fisheries and causing significant harm to the marine environment. The lack of planning means that poorly regulated scallop dredging is damaging marine habitats, while bottom trawling in concentrations of juvenile fish is leading to the killings of the next generation of fish stocks. So I would ask the Minister to address Marine Scotland's delivery of the 2015 National Marine Plan in her closing remarks. There is also a requirement under the National Pla uh, Marine Plan for regional marine plans to be developed, but as of yet, there doesn't seem to be a single such plan in place for any of Scotland's inshore waters. Without coherent regional marine planning, conflicts between fishers and other marine stakeholders will continue, hampering attempts to both protect the marine environment and to ensure the future prospects of many fisheries. So I'd ask the Minister to update the Chamber today on the progress being made towards delivering regional marine plans. And along with many other industries, Inshore fisheries will have to transition to more sustainable practices in the wake of the climate and nature crises. Whether it's adopting lower impact fishing gears or growing competition for space due to highly protected marine areas, there will be costs to this transition, which for many inshore fisheries will be prohibitive. So I hope the minister will be able to provide some detail on what conditions will be attached to any financial support the Scottish government will make available because public funds must be tied to local job creation, to fair work principles, and to sustainable practices. So to conclude, presiding officer, we need to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, and we need to do this in a way which protects and increases employment opportunities in the sector, both of which we can do, because since the UK left the common fisheries policy, the Scottish Government has assumed full responsibility for the management of Scotland's fisheries. So by addressing the issues which I've outlined today, I believe the Scottish Government can support the fishing industry into a sustainable and long-term future, because the alternative is economic hardship for many communities across Scotland and further damage to our marine environment, which nobody in this Parliament wants to see. Thank you. I call Jim Fairley to be followed by Douglas Lobsden. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, while I don't have a fishing constituency, I do like my fish, and in Scotland you're never too far from the coast. So as a livestock farmer by trade, my respect for the fisher folk is immense. In days past, I used to post pictures on social media of the conditions that I faced during some bitter winter days feeding cattle and sheep on the hills. And I often got messages from folk commiserating are telling me what a tough life farming is. And as tough as it was, I always used to try to respond, saying that fisher folk and their families had it much, much worse. Being out at sea in rough waters must be hard going at the best of times. So I can only imagine what it's like trying to make a living out on the water when the conditions change for the worse. They truly are the last wild food hunters in our everyday food system. And I'd really like to associate myself entirely with the comments from both Colin Smith and Rachel Hamilton in regards to the lost lives that fishing communities endure. Much like farmers, our fishing folk contribute enormously to our nation's food and drink output that is the envy of the world. However, over generations, political decisions have impacted our fishing industries in a way in which has rarely had the best interest of the fisher folk at heart. In the early 70s, when Ted Heath's government were negotiating the UK's entry into the EEC, they took the view that Scottish fishermen were, and I quote, expendable in light of Britain's wider European interests. It's estimated that that meant the Scottish fishing fleet was 100,000 jobs lost and hundreds of millions of pounds to the economy lost every year. That decision changed the course of history for our fishing, our fishing communities and opened the doors to a steady decline. Opening access to the continental boats employing aggressive fishing practices contributed to a significant reduction in the Scottish fleet from approximately 1,800 boats in the early 1970s to a third of that 40 years later. Furthermore, the EU's approach to continental fisheries management, the all-encompassing common fisheries policy, was a failure in many regards, with overfishing and discarding resulting in huge environmental damage, which contributed to a further weakening of the industry in Scotland. To compound matters, when the European Council meetings were taking place between the EU member states, Scotland's voice was bypassed. So who can forget the farcical situation at the November 2014 EU Agri Council in Brussels, when an unelected peer, Lord Rupert Ponsonby, took the seat in the absence of the UK minister who was absent, 
despite the fact that Scotland's highly experienced Finishing Minister Richard Lockhead was at the meeting. He was not even allowed into the room where the negotiations were happening. Now, Lord Ponsonby made the briefest of interventions, clearly not understanding his brief, and again showed the total disrespect that the UK Government has for our fishing industry. Representation is important in politics, and throughout the past 50 years it is absolutely clear that the big decisions relevant to Scotland's fisher folk has simply not worked for them. It was no surprise to me there was a fervour in the fishing community for change when many choosing to believe the Tory-driven Brexit promises a sea of opportunity. It was why they voted to leave the European Union in the first place, and it never materialised. But don't take my word for it, it came from the Chief Executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, Elspeth MacDonald. She said, this deal falls very sh far short of the commitments made and promises that were made of the commitments and promises that were made to the fishing industry by those at the highest level of government. It does not restore sovereign UK control over fisheries and does not permit us to determine who can catch what, where and when in our own waters. We are now a coastal state with one hand tied behind our back and the industry's task in the months and years ahead is to right the wrongs of this deal. Presiding officer, I'm absolutely sure that Scotland's SNP government will not be so sloppy with folks' livelihoods. It's an opportunity to influence the coastal negotiations that the Scottish Government is showing a full understanding and appreciation for the vital contributions that Scottish fishermen bring to Scotland's coastal communities, economy and larder, and that the Scottish fishing industry is facing challenges that include recovery from the pandemic, the effects of Brexit and the impacts of the cost of living crisis. This is balanced alongside the need for a sustainable, responsible approach to managing our seas based on a thorough scientific approach guided by impressive work of stakeholders and environmental organisations, some of which were presented at the roundtable discussions at the Rain Committee last month. I will take your innovation now. Rachel Hamilton. Rachel thank Hamilton. You. Uh, thank Jim Fairley for taking the intervention. Presiding officer, the Butte House agreement between the Greens and the SNP has a commitment within it to uh, extend its renewables and offshore wind sector. I'd like to ask Jim Fairley what he makes of the spatial pressures report from Elspeth MacDonald, which says that fishermen will be crowded out of our seas. Jim Fairley. Uh, Elspeth MacDonald said lots of things, but I'll also quote you back Jimmy Buchan, who previously stated that the Scottish Government has clearly listened carefully to the Scottish seafood industry in developing its seafood strategy. So by balancing the fact that Scotland is now recognising how best to deliver a long-term sustainable future for our fisher folk and our seas, and whilst I fully support the sensible negotiating position of the Scottish Government, nevertheless, with international relations a reserved matter, I am concerned by both the long and short-term trends relating to the UK's handling of what it had viewed as an expendable industry. We only have to look at last week and George Eustace's comments to hear the example of the UK Government closing its ears to concerns from the Scottish Government with its, his admittance of the terrible trade deals with both Australia and New Zealand that were largely, that were largely endorsed by the people sitting in those chairs over there. So with Scotland possessing 60 per cent of the UK sea territory, the longer term best solution for Scotland to fully realise its position as a world class fishing nation is with independence freeing us to negotiate directly with our neighbours. We cannot afford to hope for the UK Government will do the right thing by putting vital industries such as farming and fishing at the forefront of their priorities, because 50 years of evidence has proven exactly what they will do, and it is generally never good for the Scottish sectors. Thank you. And I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I would just like to uh, apologise uh, to the Chamber and to Beatrice Wishart for not being in the Chamber for all the opening speeches. Uh, representing the North East of Scotland, I know how crucial Scotland's fishing industry is to e e economies of our coastal communities. And I know that everyone in the industry works incredibly hard to put high quality food on our tables, and I thank them all for that. And many of those who work in Scotland's fishing industry voted to leave the European Union in 2016 because they saw a sea of opportunity on the horizon. The United Kingdom as an independent coastal state building our fishing industry outside of the detested common fisheries policy, something that every SNP member seems to want to bring us back into that. I will take that intervention. Jim Fairley. The, the member talks about uh, coming out of the EU and how that's been a disaster for the, the fishing industry, but the fishing industry are absolutely crying out for people, and yet your government will not allow them to take those people on. Douglas Lumsden. Exactly. What they're not crying for is to be brought back into the detested CFP that the SNP want to drag them back into. 
So the UK government secured a deal which has meant that for the first time in decades we now control our own waters. By cutting out the bureaucratic behemoth of Brussels, we can end the years of managed decline in the industry and ensure that it's enabled to not only grow, but to flourish. And that surely is what we should all want. And we're seeing that the total tonnage of fish landed in this country is increasing. And it's here in Scotland where our fishing industry is leading the way, accounting for more than 70% of landings. Yet, unfortunately, this anti-growth, anti-business, anti-fishing SNP Green Coalition is failing our industry. And this isn't just coming from me, but from industry representatives across Scotland. And time and again, we hear of examples where this SNP Green devolved government is choosing to ignore the industry. These days, we all know how important it is for us to follow the science. Yet, according to the Shetland Fishermen's Association, that goes out the window with this government when it comes to the science surrounding fisheries management. Then there is the under-resourced Marine Scotland, which, as it stands, is unable to properly deliver for the industry and is lacking an innovative approach to the challenges faced by the sector. Ultimately, it's the SNP's decision to clamber into bed with our anti-growth partners, the Greens, in a desperate attempt to cling on to power that is holding back the sector. A coalition that the Scottish Fishing Federation says is fueling an increasingly hostile environment towards the industry. And let us not forget, President Officer, it's the coalition partners in this nationalist administration that would disgracefully drag Scotland's fishing industry back into the hated CFB, throwing away new opportunities only to satisfy their blind pursuit for division. And while this government ignores the fishing industry, those in the sector can rest assured that the UK government is standing up for them. The UK government indicated in its 2018 Sustainable Fisheries White Paper that it intended to be a champion of sustainable fishing the length and breadth of our United Kingdom. Unlike the Scottish government, that is what the UK government is doing. By angling for opportunity, this country has regained additional quota from the European Union worth around £146 million over the next five years, which is to be shared among the four nations of the UK. And we can certainly see that all around us, there's plenty more fish in the sea. We also see that, saw the UK government launch the UK's UK Seafood Fund. This fund, worth £100 million, is there to level up coastal communities across the UK, supporting the industry to process more fish landed in the UK, create new job opportunities throughout the supply chain, upskill the workforce, train new entrants and invest in the technologies to put the industry at the cutting edge of sustainable fishing. Presiding officer, did the SNP welcome the support for the Scottish coastal communities? Of course they didn't. How dare the UK government do something to support Scotland's fishing industry? As it is abundantly clear, the SNP would much rather play petty constitutional politics than deliver for Scotland's fishermen. But I will give the Minister some ideas of how the Scottish Government could help the fishing industry. The transport links to Peterhead are a disgrace. There is no rail, so producers have to rely on a single track road that goes past the notorious toll of Barnes. I will take a, I will take a Karen Adam. Oh, you be, um, thank, I thank the member for taking the intervention. In terms of rail to Peterhead, I have been working with campaign group Campaign for North East Rail on that. Um, I am asking the member if he will join with me in that campaign to, to try and ensure that we do get rail back there. Douglas Lumsden. We've been looking at that rail, but there is no rail just now, so the quickest thing to do would be improve the roads up to Peterhead. Surely, surely the member would support that. And uh, fish processors are reluctant to invest in improved buildings in Aberdeen because they, they face a crippling business rates bill. If the government cared about the fishing industry, it would sort that out. And let's look at the lack of investment in new automation equipment. If the government cared about the fishing industry, it would sort that out. They have the powers, they just need to use it. The UK government is no, not only acting in the interests of our fishing industry, it is listening to them. Earlier this month, Scottish Office Minister John Lamont visited Scottish fisheries in Shetland and will soon be chairing the next meeting of the Scottish Seafood Industry Action Group. Meanwhile, I'm left wondering if Lorna Slater has yet managed to figure out where the Scottish fish farms are located. The UK government is meeting with, fish, with industry stakeholders, listening to what they need and what challenges they face, working with them to ensure that they succeed and deliver smooth seas for the future. 
Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I call Emma Harper, the final speaker in the open debate. OK, thank you, President Officer. We have heard some interesting contributions this afternoon from other members in the debate, including those that have strong fishing connections in their areas, as I do, especially inshore fishing across the South Scotland region. We have important fishing communities in Eyemouth, Kirkubri and in Shinrar, as well as other locations across the south west of my region. And like Jim Fairley, I want to acknowledge what both Colin Smith and what Rachel Hamilton have said and have rightly highlighted that the dangers that are faced by our fishermen when they are out ca catching and supplying food for us all. It is really important that you have mentioned that today, so thank you for that. Rightly, the Scottish Government's key priority throughout these negotiations is always to protect Scottish interests by securing sustainable catching opportunities for our Scottish fishermen. And as others have said, it is important to work within environmental limits, making sure fish stocks are managed sustainably while providing a resource for our future generations and safeguarding the diversity of our marine ecosystems. This is part of responsible fisheries management. It would be wrong not to recognise the significant pressures on the Scottish fishing in industry um, that they are currently facing, including recovery from the pandemic, the effects of Brexit and the impacts of the cost of living crisis. We have heard that from others already this afternoon. And fishing opportunities for the majority of key stocks for the Scottish fishing in industry are negotiated annually through a variety of multi-party and bilateral forums. And the UK's exit from the EU has had a devastating impact on the seafood sector overall. The end of the Brexit discussions concluded with the Trade and Cooperation Agreement on 24 December 2020, which clearly did not deliver on the promises, particularly on the uplifts on, in all quota shares made by the UK Government. And following exit from the European Union, the UK has now become an independent coastal state and has conducted negotiations on this footing since 2021. The Scottish Government's key priority throughout negotiations is always to protect Scottish interests by securing sustainable catching opportunities. However, the Tories' promise of a sea of opportunity, and this is not the first time it has been mentioned this afternoon, for Scottish fishing industry has now been exposed as completely hollow. Jim Fairley is right when he said the fishing industry has been clear in expressing its views. Scottish fishing. I, I don't think there's time, Mr. Carson, because there's been a lot of um, interventions this afternoon. So I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep going ahead because I do want to respond about common fisheries policy that's been brought up as well. Um, so the Scottish Fishermen's Federation Chief Exec, Elspeth Macdonald, she did say that the Brexit deal on fisheries fell far short of what the industry had sought and what the UK government had promised. And also, Mark, uh, Mike Park, the CEO of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, he said it is clear for the offshore catching sector that Brexit failed to deliver any benefits of being a coastal state. And Scottish Seafood Association CEO Jimmy Buchan said fishers had been badly let down, while post-Brexit trading conditions for processors was challenging at best. Indeed, over 70 per cent of Scottish seafood exports were to the EU in 2019, worth over £770 million. And in 2019, seafood accounted for 57 per cent of Scotland's overall food exports and had a total value of £1.02 billion. And landings by the Scottish vessels accounted for 61 per cent of the value and 67 per cent of tonnage of all landings by the UK vessels. And I know members have mentioned that the landings has increased but actually the value has decreased. So that's a really important point to make as well. And it's something that I think we can explore, I suppose, in further detail um, as we move forward. The Scottish Government will continue to support our industry to recover from the Tories' Brexit betrayal and press for the £62 million of marine funding that Scotland is entitled to to be fully allocated to Scotland. However, the impact I'm, I'm, I'm said no, I'm going to continue. However, the impact of Brexit on our fishing industry and indeed on losing our position in these negotiations must be made clear. Through the UK Seafood Fund, the UK Government is directly funding projects in the devolved administrations in the devolved policy area. Additional spending for these businesses and initiatives in Scotland is always welcome. However, it, simply is, it isn't just simply additional funding. First and foremost, this is UK Government spending in an area devolved to the Scottish Government, in an area of crucial importance to Scotland. 
It is imperative that the Scottish Government is accountable to the Scottish Parliament and that it makes decisions about how marine and fisheries funding is spent in line with Scotland's priorities. The UK Government is presenting the UK Seafood Fund as a solution to all the industry's challenges, with more landings and more opportunity to support the long-term economic development in coastal communities. But Brexit has had a devastating impact, and it has not delivered on the promises made in relation to uplift in all quota shares. It has promised in the past, but it has not been delivered. If the appropriate share of the £100 million funding for the UK Seafood Fund had been allocated to the Scottish Government directly, it would have been able to support meaningful investments informed by its detailed engagement with Scotland's marine and seafood sectors in support of our blue economy. Instead, what we have is the UK Seafood Fund operating in the same space as the Marine Fund Scotland scheme. The, the, the Scottish Government does not ask to administer devolved expenditure in England, so there is no reason why the UK Government should do it in Scotland. Presiding officer, in closing, what we need to make sure that there is an opportunity that we can do better and we can actually be at the table front and centre. Front and centre of negotiations in the future will bring about improvements and a better deal for our fishing communities. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to winding up speeches, and I call on Colin Smith up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Today's debate has highlighted the importance of the fishing sector to all of Scotland, but in particular, I think the coastal communities many of us have the privilege of representing, showing how crucial the current fisheries negotiations are and how vital the consequential decisions the Scottish Government will make on quota distribution will be for the industry and for our environment. Paul McClellan spoke about the, not just the, the proud history of fishing in the East Lothian, but its importance today for the county. Karen Adams spoke about the pride in fishing communities in her North East constituency. And I had the privilege of, of recently visiting the port of Peterhead and the fish market with my colleague Anas Sarwas to see just how important that is to the community, but also the whole of Scotland's fishing industry. And Emma Harper highlighted the importance of fishing in the South Scotland region with its Eyemouth, Strunra or in Kirkubri. However, a number of members spoke about the significant challenges the industry now faces as the current negotiations take place. Several members highlighted that the continuing impact of Brexit, and Siobhan Brown in particular, highlighted that over 70 per cent of fish exports go to the EU. That is over £1.6 billion from the UK. So any barriers to market is a barrier for our fishing industry. And Rhoda Grant spoke about the well-documented challenges the industry has, has access in labour as a result of the terms of the, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. That agreement has delivered not as much the, the, the sea of opportunity that Douglas Lumsden claimed, but more an ocean of uncertainty, with barriers to market and to labour which have all but cancelled out the very incremental increase in the share of fisheries Scotland's fishers will see up to 2026. Now, a key issue in the debate raised by a large number of members, Rachel Hamilton, Jamie Halcrow, Johnston, Beatrice Wisher and many others, was the practical challenges for fishing of the accelerated expansion of offshore wind and the pace of application of management measures within marine protected areas, the so-called spatial squeeze, which should not just be seen as a, a well-known view of the fishing sector and their representative bodies, such as the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, but which needs to be better recognised by those involved in the planning and regulation of the marine area. Beatrice Wishart was right when she said it is not a just transition for one sector to squeeze out another sector. The Scottish Government have failed to implement the 2015 National Marine Plan, including spatial planning, and as Mercedes Villalba said, there has been an absence of regional marine plans 12 years after the passage of the Marine Scotland Act and seven years since the first National Marine Plan was approved. The need for those plans has never been more important, both for the economic uses of our seas, but also its vital ecological restoration. As Karen Adam, Ariana Burgess and Mercedes Villalba all said, today's debate comes at a time the world has been meeting in Egypt at COP27. We cannot underestimate the environmental importance of our seas in capturing and storing excess carbon from the atmosphere, highlighting the importance of proper fisheries management in combating climate change. Myself and Mercedes Villalba set out Labour's five tests which will continue to judge the Government on in relation to the establishment and distribution of sustainable fishing quotas and the management of our seas, whether those negotiations and quota 
distribution deliver a better deal for smaller boats, whether they lead to more catch being landed in our Scottish ports, whether they deliver a lower impact and more sustainable fishing industry for the benefit of our environment, for our coastal communities and for the whole future of Scottish fishing. We know that there are some fishing method methods which cause more environmental damage. In June of this year, Open Seas, in partnership with Greenpeace, began touring the Scottish coastline to document the health of the seabed and observe the fishing practices taking place in UK protected areas. Operation Ocean Witness actively investigated the current health of our oceans and the damage poorly regulated fishing can have on our seabeds and marine life. They gained valuable insights into the health of our marine environment from mapping Orkney seagrass beds to investigating and evidencing the impact of bottom toad fisheries on biogenetic reefs. The Scottish Government's own marine assessment in 2020 found that it had failed to meet targets to prevent damage to priority marine environments, which caused five large seabed habitats to shrink. This work highlighted the importance of marine protected areas, but also the need to better incentivise a change to lower impact fishing methods. And I welcome the fact that Ariana Burgess supports Labour's call for progress on this to be reported on on an annual basis by the government. A number of me members raised the issue of the scientific advice used in negotiating quotas and agreeing their distribution, not least because it is by its very nature never 100 per cent accurate. Obviously, when the advice is more positive, such as the case with COD this year, it is often welcomed, but maybe not so much when it recommends a reduction in quota. It is important that any advice is scrutinised, and if we feel it is not robust, it should be challenged, because it has such a profound impact on the livelihood of our fishers. Finlay Carson, Rachel Hamilton and Rhoda Grant all made an important point that we needed buy-in from our fishers, so they have a role in helping supplement the science from their knowledge and for their, from their vast experience. But that, of course, is very different from entering negotiations on the basis of how do we try to find a way around the scientific advice if we simply do not like it. Presiding officer, in concluding, there is unquestionably a challenge and at times a difference of opinion in how we balance the environmental, social and economic impact of fishing, how we protect the livelihoods of those who work in the fishing sector while also preserving, indeed saving, our diverse marine environment. But what I think this debate has shown is that one thing that is not in question, what is not in doubt, is the importance and recognition that all speakers place on the commitment, indeed the bravery, of Scotland's fishers, who day in, day out, continue to deliver that high quality low low carbon food to our tables and for that we are very much in all of their debt. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Finlay Carson up to eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, not that we needed reminded, but today we've heard about the, the crucial role that fishing plays in Scottish life and, and many of the comments made today during the debate reflect, uh, reflect the importance that we place on the sector, both in terms of food, trade and environment. It can, of course, be a precarious industry, both in terms of business and in safety. And I join with Colin Smith and others across the chamber in sending my condolences to the family of the fisherman who lost his life despite valiant efforts uh, from Port Patrick Inshore Lifeboat and Emergency Services uh, this weekend. My constituency has had its share of tragedies with the Solby Harvester and the Marielle sinking still fresh in our minds. We must never forget the men and women who put to sea every day to put high quality, environmentally sustainable food on our table. Our thoughts are always with every family who have lost a loved one and our thanks goes out to everyone who sets sail around our coasts. As a result of leaving the Common Fisheries Policy in 2020, the UK Government is now an independent coastal state, which means the UK and Scottish Governments now have control over its own fishing destiny. As my colleague Jamie Halker Johnson said, we have, after so long, finally emerged from the CFP. And while we are still in the early days of adapting to this renewed status, it does offer opportunities to create a more sustainable and workable sector. Most notably, having independent coastal state status involves being responsible for our relationships with other international actors. While it is not perfect, as an independent coastal state and as part of the EU TCA, we will see a 25 per cent of existing EU quota being transferred to the UK. And the UK Government has also successfully negotiated a deal to access Norway's waters with an estimated value of 16 million. 
something that Jim Fairley failed to recognise and, as usual, concentrated on constitutional grievance, which does no one any favours, fishers or wider Scotland. Today, uh, I'm afraid I've got no time. Today, there will be a joint fisheries statement with the UK Government and the Scottish Government, and they will announce catch quotas in the post-Brexit world. It is a hugely complex issue with, not much, uh, with much behind the scenes negotiating, but there is well, uh, widespread belief within DEFRA and others that the announcement tomorrow will be broadly welcomed by industry. On Thursday, our former MSP colleague and now Minister John Lamont will host his first meeting as the chair of the Scottish Seafood Industry Action Group at Queen Elizabeth House in Edinburgh, involving UK Government and Scottish Ministers, along with representatives of the seafood, catching, processing and aquaculture sectors. I look forward to hearing about the many positive outcomes uh, that are agreed with both our governments as a result of these uh, discussions. I and many in the chambers, but sadly not all, understand the importance of cooperation and the working between our two governments, especially when it comes up to standing up for Scottish interests internationally. I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Jamie Halker Johnson again when he says that people, whether in this parliament or out working in Scotland seas, ought to expect that both governments will be working positively together to build more effective arrangements for the sector. Similarly, uh, Douglas Lumsden touched on the detested common fisheries policy and that it was one of the reasons that the Scottish fishing industry voted to leave Europe in 2016. I acknowledge there have been some issues with the deal we have at the moment, but we are already seeing the total tonnage of fish landed in this country is increasing. And in Scotland, where our industry is leading the way, accounting for more than 70 per cent of landings. Of course, it is critical that we follow scientific evidence to help uh, recover fish populations. I am sorry, I do not have any time. Uh, earlier this month, I was pleased to host, albeit remotely, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, reception, where the importance of science was highlighted uh, and the need for industry and scientists to work hand in hand to gain a better understanding of our marine resources and ensure government act in response to the need of all stakeholders, fishers, coastal communities and the marine environment. Right now, the lack of scientific data is a re of real concern, something in, uh, raised uh, today uh, by others, including Rhoda Grant. It is vital that the Scottish Government delivers the UK Fisheries Act 2020 as well as uh, create a spatial plan for fishing to prevent gear conflict and protect nursery spawning grounds. Our seas are a, a public asset. Fish are a public resource that should be managed to achieve the optimal social, economic and environmental benefit for the people of Scotland. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation has already highlighted, and we have heard today on numerous occasions, about the spatial squeeze and how our seas are becoming increasingly crowded. It is evident that more and more calls uh, for the use of our sea, uh, but until recently there has been little recognition of the accumulative impact on fishing of different activities and policies. It is a bit like the government are failing to appreciate the accumulative impact of wind farms in uh, rural areas. The fishing industry has for some time laid out their concerns around the cumulative impact on the sector, including pipelines, cabling, uh, wind farms and, and the unintended consequences of spatial pressures. And this was highlighted by Rachel Hamilton, uh, Beatrice Wishart and others. Along with its counterparts, the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisation in England, the SFF, commissioned a report to look at the spatial squeeze in fishing from other activities and policies in the marine environment and how both now and uh, for looking ahead. Uh, this work was carried out by a well-known uh, and well-regarded firm of marine consultants. From the fishermen's perspective, their results look pretty alarming. What it showed is that almost over the next 30 years, in the worst case scenario, trawling could be restricted from over half of Scotland's share of the UK's exclusive economic zone. Worryingly, the report considers that the future demand for space in our seas uh, will be on a scale not previously seen, and that the displacement of fishing could be very significant on an order of magnitude that cannot be absorbed by remaining, uh, uh, on the remaining ground. Yet, surprisingly, there has been no meaningful engagement from policymakers on the displacement effort, nor attempts to quantify the impacts. There is sometimes an assumption that fishing activity can just somehow shift somewhere else without incurring cost or impact, and this is simply wrong. Both the UK and Scottish governments must ensure that fishing is not squeezed out of our crowded seas. There is no doubt that we have to find better ways of allowing different activities to successfully coexist. Encouraging and enabling some of the significant uh, 
uncertainties. It is around just transition and how we adjust to addressing biodiversity loss and climate change. And, and Rachel Hamilton, in her contribution, highlighted the views of Sheila Keith from the Shetland Fishermen's Association, who said that the Scottish Government needs to be uh, more transparent uh, and follow the science, not only to tackle climate change, but to tackle the challenges in our seas. But we can do both. We can tackle climate change and help Scottish fisheries to survive and thrive. The Butte House Agreement by the Greens and SNP to, uh, to secure a mandate for independence is not uh, the best thing. Uh, and, and we see that uh, there's a, an idea that we can put aside at least 10 per cent of our seas in highly protected areas uh, where essentially nothing will be permitted. But that in isolation won't help reach our climate ambitions if we end up relying on food that's been flown in from thousands of miles away, food that might not be sourced as sustainably as in the, the, the Scottish fishing industry. There needs to be a continual improvement, but unlike Labour and others in the Chamber, us on these benches will recognise the marked improvements driven by the fishing industry. The percentage fished sustainably in 2020 was the highest record recorded since data collection started, with an estimated 69% of commercial fish stocks fished at sustainable levels, representing a 35% point increase from 2000, demonstrating the ongoing recovery of the commercial fish stocks, not the decline. Scotland's fishing industry and fishing communities want to be part of Scotland's transition to net zero, but it needs space to fish in and the right political support for the sector to thrive, not just survive. Thank you. I call on Mary Goujon to wind up. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I really just want to thank, uh, begin by thanking members for their speeches and interventions this afternoon, because I really welcome the interest taken in what are important annual negotiations for Scotland. And it's also clear, I think, from the debate today that there's no shortage of issues to discuss. And I think what we've seen from the wide range of views is, I think it really underlines the complexity and the importance of these just issues for fishing and coastal communities across Scotland. And I also really appreciate the, the really personal contributions from, from people today. And I think it's really clear just how important that culture and heritage associated with the fishing industry is too. But I do want to emphasise that we are fortunate in Scotland in that we're represented in negotiations by fisheries managers who do have a wealth of experience. And I really am confident that they will, again, deliver a good deal for our industry. Throughout the negotiations, we will continue to take principled, robust positions based on the best available scientific information, as well as taking into account socio-economic factors. And I really look forward to continuing discussions with our coastal state partners over the coming weeks and reporting back to Parliament uh, uh, on the conclusion of the negotiations in due course. Now, moving on to some of the key points raised this afternoon, of which there were many, and I really do want to try and address as many as possible. I think I first of all uh, want to come to, the, uh, to Colin Smith's uh, amendment and there are I, and to say first of all I think that there are elements of the amendment uh, that I do support and would have been happy to, to get behind and I think particularly as we've heard from members across the chamber today that recognition of the resilience and, and bravery of our fishers who really risk their lives every day to, to keep us with that supply of food and help us in that, that food security. I also support the when it talks about the support and development of our processing sector. I know that Colin Smith and Ariane Burgess asked for consideration um, of a, a yearly report, and that's something I will take away, look at, and fully consider, and come back to the member on. Um, but I think turning to the other areas within the amendment, and ultimately why I am unable to support it, as I set out in my introductory remarks, with the exception of two stocks, Every quota that we have is shared with partners and negotiated to reach agreed positions. And following the outcome of these negotiations, Scotland will eventually get a portion of that UK allocation. For many key stocks, Scotland's quota share doesn't reflect the prevalence of these stock in our waters or their importance to the Scottish fishing fleet. And that's a key reason why Brexit was such a bitter disappointment because we didn't get the rebalancing of catching opportunities that our fishing industry expected. So it's not a simple Scotland-only choice when it comes to setting tack for stocks in Scottish waters. The Scottish Government is committed to rebuilding stocks, 
And our principle for tax setting is to follow the scientific advice and set sustainable limits with an aim of securing opportunities that are consistent with maximum sustainable yield objectives, whatever that's appropriate. And in doing that, the UK's Fishery Act 2020 requires that environmental, economic and social considerations are appropriately balanced. We also need to consider, though, the choke risk that's in mixed fisheries, stability for industries, avoiding large year-on-year -year uh, fluctuations in tack levels, facilitating stock monitoring, as well as other factors. And for many key stocks, the Scottish industry is required to swap or purchase fishing opportunities each year, as Scotland's allocation doesn't meet the requirements of the fishing fleet. And this is often at great cost to the industry and a result of the UK quota system that the Scottish industry operates in. So we have to be alive to the considerable impact on our vulnerable coastal communities that cuts in allowable catches have. And were we to adopt this amendment and unilaterally set Scottish quotas without consideration for the nuances of wider fisheries management, this would adversely impact Scotland's fleet and fish stocks and set us at a disadvantage compared to other coastal states. Now, moving on to how we allocate fishing opportunities, and I know this was an area that came up quite often today, the Scottish Government allocates fishing quota in line with our domestic and international obligations. For 2021 and 2022, we sought to widen that socio-economic benefit and reduce environmental impact by allocating quota to methods of fishing associated with the reduced environmental uh, impact. So, for example, by allocating extra mackerel and cod directly to the inshore 10 metre and underfleet. Now, the economic link was a point that was raised, again, that's touched on in the, uh, the amendment to the motion put forward by Colin Smith today. In relation to the economic link provisions covering Scottish vessels, amended provisions for Scottish vessels will take effect in 2023, and the amendments which have been introduced mean that for, key, for species of key importance to Scotland, vessels will either have to land a set percentage into Scotland or provide the Scottish Government with fishing opportunities that we will then transfer to other sectors of the industry, such as inshore vessels. These amendments are proportionate and they'll help ensure that a fair economic link exists for Scottish vessels, which will provide long-term benefits to our Scottish fishing communities. Now, elsewhere, uh, I have already previously spoken about the importance of robust scientific information. I know that this was a point that was raised by Rachel Hamilton and others across the chamber today. Scotland is committed to ensuring that our policies and decision-making are underpinned by clear evidence and science. And our position has always been to deliver the best outcome for Scotland's fishing interests through securing sustainable catching opportunities. And the advice we receive from ICES is a key part of that process. Now, ICES and its contributing experts are making huge efforts to improve their processes, their methodologies and their quality assurance. And that will help to give greater confidence in the scientific advice we receive going forward. I know that Siobhan Brown had raised in her contribution, uh, she had asked about working with the industry uh, in terms of that science. And I think I'm always happy to engage with the sector as well as uh, with academics too, because I think with the best will in the world and with the best resource in the world, given the sheer size and scale of our marine area, it wouldn't be possible for us to undertake all the science that, that we would like to do. So we're always happy to consider what partnerships we can look at uh, to take forward. In relation to... Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to take that. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, White had said that she thought that it, we should look at a Norwegian model. The Scottish Government are, are continuing to ignore scientific advice and we should bring fishermen in um, to allow them to give us data, to give us reference data. I wonder what the Cabinet Secretary um, thinks of her proposal. Cabinet Secretary. I'm always happy to consider and look at what happens elsewhere to see if there's any processes that we can prove and ultimately, just as I was saying and emphasising there, to work with the industry to see how we can take, uh, take that forward. Now, in relation to fisheries management within Scotland, it's underpinned by a number of national and international commitments and goals. And our fisheries management strategy affirms our commitment to being a world leader in sustainable and responsible fisheries management. We have been making progress on a number of actions set out in the strategy, some of which I, I just want to take a little bit of time to outline today. And firstly, covering Scotland's future catching policy. So that will see concrete action taken to support fishers to avoid catching fish and other species which they don't want to land or catch in the first place. 
including decreasing instances of accidental bycatch of protected marine species and overall reducing waste and improving environmental outcomes. So that's where I would disagree with the take that was put on that by, by Colin Smith because ultimately it will ensure that we have the right rules in place and that we avoid a rigid one-size-fits-all approach which simply doesn't work in a mixed fishery and among such a diverse fishing fleet. I am, not at the moment, sorry, I do need to make some progress uh, and give some more information on this point because I think it is really critical that there is an understanding of what the future catching policy is trying to achieve because it also has co-management at its centre. It puts a significant emphasis on working with fishers and others to develop pragmatic measures which are designed to address the challenges around the current landing obligation. Because, for example, under the current landing obligation, there are a total of 480 stock exemptions. 385 are based on de minimis and 95 for high survivability. So, of course, that is complex. It also lacks transparency, meaning that it can be difficult to account for their usage, hard to translate in terms of the impact on fish stocks and really challenging to enforce. So making it one of the key issues with the operability of the landing obligation as it stands. So ultimately, what the future catching policy aims to do is to simplify the current exemptions exemptions, which will increase that transparency and will increase that accountability. The proposals within it don't seek to undermine the integrity of the landing obligation because we are firmly committed to the principles behind it and they're also in the spirit of the existing legislation and the obje objectives of the, of the CFP. Now, our approach to sea fisheries, compliance and science is already world class and the introduction of remote electronic monitoring to key fishing fleet segments is going to enhance our capabilities and build on the solid foundation we already have in place, supplementing our existing approach and resources. We've committed to introducing legislation to make REM on scallop dredge vessels and pelagic vessels a mandatory requirement and as part of that we'll deliver equivalents for all vessels operating in Scottish waters. And for scallop vessels, the the mandatory element builds on a successful voluntary introduction via the inshore modernisation programme, which has seen around 95% of the active Scottish scallop dredge fleet kitted out. One last point that I want to cover, which I know has come up today, and which I think is really important to address before closing, is Very about brief, the spatial please. squeeze. Scotland's marine space is of great importance for the health of people and our planet and a, a recognition of this is rapidly growing across society and like other nations we're facing that twin crises of climate change and loss of nature and biodiversity. We know that there is increased competition for marine space and we're committed to understanding the impact to the fishing industry including displacement effects from other marine spatial demands including nature conservation and offshore wind activities and that's where we really welcome the SFF report uh, that they'd commissioned to look at uh, this in more detail. I must ask you to conclude, Cabinet Secretary. I am coming to a close, but essentially to make the point that we will be working together with the fishing industry as we look to address these issues, which, as we know from the debate today, are very complex, they're interlinked, and about all of it, it's about finding that balance through Thank it. You, Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on Scotland's approach to 2022 coastal states negotiations, securing principled sustainable outcomes. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 6912 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 6912 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that amendment 6889.1 in the name of Colin Smith which seeks to amend motion 6889 in the name of Mary Goujon on Scotland's approach to 2022 coastal states negotiations securing principled sustainable outcomes be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote. There'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.